गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम टू दी टेक्निकल प्रेजेंटेशन बाय न्यूली इलेक्टेड फेलोज एंड फॉरन फेलोज विच शैल बी कैरिड आउट इन पैरल सेशन इन दी फर्स्ट ग्रुप टू सर पैरल सेशन फीचरिंग प्रेजेंटेशन शैल बी मेड बाय फेलोज इलेक्टेड इन इंजीनियरिंग सेक्शन नेमली सिविल इंजीनियरिंग मकैनिकल इंजीनियरिंग केमिकल इंजीनियरिंग एरोस्पेस इंजीनियरिंग and mining metallurgical and materials engineering in the second group two parallel sessions shall be featured for fellows elected in engineering sections namely computer engineering and information technology electrical engineering electronics and communication engineering energy engineering interdisciplinary engineering and special engineering fields and leaderships in academia r&d and industry the lectures shall cover their most significant scientific and engineering contributions and highlight the motivation novelty and significance of their work that have been recognized by their election to fellowship of the academy i'm sure that you will enjoy the presentations and it shall be my delight to introduce the fellows and invite them to deliver the lectures we are starting with parallel subsessions namely engineering section 2 computer engineering and information technology engineering section 5 electrical engineering engineering section 6 electronics and communication engineering we'll first start with section 2 that is computer engineering and information technology and i now invite professor andrew zisserman frs professor of computer vision engineering at oxford university hello i'm andrew zisserman and i'm going to talk on audio visual ai my research is in computer vision it is a field that aims to extract visual information from images and videos so for example being able to say what is in this image what the objects the animals the people where they are so the, the 3d scene layout the shape of the objects the pose of the humans and also what is happening in the video what are the actions what are the activities what's going to happen next and i'm going to start this talk by showing three examples of visual capabilities of modern computer vision systems the first capability is object detection and tracking and what you're seeing here are objects like aeroplanes and various types of animals appearing they're being detected that's a box around them and recognized and then they're tracked the second capability is face recognition this works for humans but it also works for chimpanzees here you see the face is recognized Now, the third capability is lip reading. You're going to see a video playing in slow motion, and what's being said will be determined from the lip movements and will be written as text at the bottom of the frame. Three examples I just showed you were achieved by using deep learning. So, for example, for recognizing what's in an image, deep learning would involve having a network which can map between the image and the vector, and the vector would then be used to identify what's in the image. Now, a network can typically have between 10 and 100 million parameters, and all of these parameters need to be set or trained. And the training of the network is cast as an optimization problem, where the network is trained to predict the labels of images and it might be a million images that it has to predict and so here's the problem the network has to predict the labels of a million images in order to be trained but of course in order to know the labels someone has to provide them and so typically what's done is for a large scale data set like imagenet each image is labeled by hand so for a million images people have to say what's in the image and that's very expensive now in this talk what i'm going to explore is an alternative to manually labeling all these images where the data is used to provide the labels itself 
To motivate this, consider how an infant learns to perceive the world. Now it's clear that infants do not acquire their perception skills by being taught from one million labelled images. And in fact, developmental psychologists have pointed out that an important source of learning is from the correlation between data streams, between the visual and audio. And that's what we're going to use here. In this area of the research where the data provides the supervision is known as cell supervision. And for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to study how a network can be trained from the synchronization of the raw audio and visual data streams. So the key idea is that a, a temporal event, such as a, a ball dropping, provides a synchronization signal, a timestamp between the audio and visual streams, or more generally, that the correlation between the audio and visual streams can be used to determine the synchronization. Now, this idea of learning from raw data in this way is not a new idea. But what is new is that we now have the computer machinery to achieve it and use it for tasks. In the rest of the talk, I'm going to give two examples of learning from raw data streams. The first is audiovisual synchronization, and the second is audiovisual speech enhancement. So, for task definition, we want to train a network that takes in a visual stream and an audio stream and can determine if they're synchronized or not. So I'll illustrate the problem. Here is a video where the audio and visual, visual streams are synchronized. Now we shift the audio. And you'll see now clearly that the audio and visual streams are not synchronized. Now in this way, we can obtain training data for the network. So we'll refer to clips where the audio and visual streams are in sync as positive samples and clips where the audio and visual are out of sync as negative samples. And given a video, we can easily get positive samples by taking short sequences at the same place in the audio and visual streams. And we can get any number of these and simply get negatives by taking the audio and visual stream offset like this. So that's how we generate samples from one video and we can do this across thousands or hundreds of thousands of videos. Now this is a network we want to train. It consists of two sub-networks. There's a, a visual sub-network that ingests the video stream and produces a vector and there's an audio sub-network that ingests the audio stream and produces a vector. And to train this is an optimization problem and we formulate it as we want the vectors produced by these two networks to be close when the data going in is synchronized, so a positive sample, and far apart when the data going in is not synchronized, so a negative sample. And we train this, as I said, on samples taken from hundreds or thousands of hours of video. And in this way, we set all the parameters of the network. Now, once the network is trained, it can be used for a number of tasks. And the first I'm going to show is determining who is speaking in a video. And the way that is done is to send the audio stream into the network and then test out which of the faces has movements that are synchronized with that audio stream. So the way this is done is the network ingests the audio and visual stream like this and then produces a heat map of the synchronization on the right. I'll show you that for a few examples. So here will be videos from the TV series Friends. And on the left, you'll see the heat map. And on the right, you'll see a, a box around each of the talking heads. And the box will turn blue when the person is speaking. I have to say, Tupelo Honey by Van Morrison. No, not even with your best friend. No. That is so sad. The calming sounds of the babbling brook. And another application is fixing lip synchronization problems on videos. So I'm going to show you a video where it starts off being out of sync. We then use the network to determine the offset to make it in sync, and then you'll see it synchronized. Of heavy rain and probably four or five hours of heavy rain ahead. 
I was in the camps yesterday talking to people. There are 1.3 million earthquake survivors still living in those crowded camps. Of heavy rain and probably four or five hours of heavy rain ahead. I was in the camps yesterday talking to people. There are 1.3 million earthquake survivors still living in those crowded Now I'm going to move on to the second example, which again is going to use the synchronization between the audio stream and visual stream, and here between speech and the lip movement. And we're going to use it for the tasks of audio source separation and speech enhancement. So to motivate this, imagine you're in a noisy environment, like a restaurant with many people speaking, or in a car with ambient noise, and in these circumstances, it's very hard to hear what's being said. But you know that if you attend to a person and watch their lips, then often that can help make their voice clearer and pick out their voice. And we're going to build on that in this application. I'm going to illustrate what we're going to do. I'll show you a video of two people talking and the position of the mouse will illustrate which lips we're attending to. Asked me to do something, I would just do it. You know, it, just came in. it was in that first movie that I sat down, I had just been fired from this thing called Hallamaria because I wouldn't follow along with what they wanted to do. said, no. So to define the task clearly, we have inputs which consist of the video stream of the target face and the audio with multiple people speaking. That's going to go through a, a network which we need to train and the output we want is the speech just from the target speaker. So the question is, how do we train a network like this? For training, we start with a video of the target speaker and the audio of their speech, and we can obtain audio input from multiple speakers simply by adding in the audio track of other speaking videos. And the optimization problem then is to minimize the difference between the original target audio and the output of the network. And we can apply this at large scale to hundreds of thousands of video clips with thousands of different speakers. I'm going to show you some more examples of using the train network. First of all, to isolate individual speakers when there are three people speaking. I'll start off by playing you the video. How do you think that's fair? Aaron, let me say the following. I will tell you there are emotional okay. stories Aaron, on both following. sides of that. How do you think that's fair? You want to have uh, you know, emotional stories? I will tell you there are emotional stories on both sides of this issue. Aaron, let me say, let me say the following. Aaron, let me say the following. Aaron, let me say the following, please. Tom, if you could be, if you can calm down just a tad. And now a final example, removing ambient noise. On some circuits, while it may enter a straight slower than the LMP1 car, it will finish it faster. On some circuits, while it may enter a straight slower than the LMP1 car, it will finish it faster. There are several possible applications of this technology. It could be used to make video calls like Zoom in a noisy environment. For the hard of hearing, it could be used with smart glasses as an audiovisual hearing aid. And it can be used to improve the quality of automatic subtitle generation on noisy videos. So that's the end of this short lecture. And the main ideas I've covered are that we can learn visual capabilities from audio and visual video streams, that this can be achieved using self-supervised learning, there's no manual annotation required. And I've illustrated it with the tasks of audio-visual synchronization and audio-visual source separation and speech enhancement. And of course, there's much more work on self-supervised learning. It can be used for the visual tasks I gave examples of at the beginning of the lecture, tracking, 
object recognition, face recognition, and many other vision tasks like street and geometry prediction. Uh, and to conclude, I'd like to thank some of my colleagues in India who I've worked with for many years, and they're listed here, and also to thank the funding agencies for supporting my research. Thank you, Professor Zissaman. I invite Mr. Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google and Alphabet USA. Hello to the fellows and members of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. It's an honor to join you today to share some of the technical achievements in my journey to impact people through technology. Of course, no achievement is accomplished alone. I'm grateful to the teachers, professors, and mentors who have taught and inspired me, and to my fellow engineers and colleagues who did the hard work alongside me. These achievements are theirs as much, if not more so, than my own. I also want to acknowledge that the work we choose is part of a larger story of who we are as individuals, a story of what shapes us and what drives us. So that's where I'll begin. I grew up in Chennai. My parents worked hard to create an environment of learning and knowledge. These values formed a strong foundation for my life. While I didn't have access to a computer growing up, I was passionate about technology and read everything I could about it. Every new technology changed our lives for the better, from the rotary phone to the television. It's what inspired me to bring technology to as many people as possible. My father was an engineer, so I was following in his footsteps when I enrolled at IIT Kharagpur. After graduating, I continued my studies in material sciences at Stanford. On campus, I spent whatever time I could in the computer lab. Having regular access to computing was a turning point for me. Computing itself was at an inflection point as well. That September, the Mosaic web browser was released, which popularized the World Wide Web. These two shifts in my own perspective and in computing would put me on a path that led to Google. I joined Google in 2004. I was drawn to the company because of its mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I was also inspired by the promise of Web 2.0. At the time, the web was evolving from content to rich interactive applications. It's what made things like Gmail, Google Maps, and Flickr possible. Developers were putting more and more apps online, bringing the internet to life in an exciting new way. We saw this as an opportunity to completely rethink the web browser, and not just a browser, but a modern operating system that could move the web forward for everyone. So that's what we set out to build. This wasn't a marketing decision or even a business decision. It was an engineering insight, and it required deep engineering capabilities to get it right. From the beginning, we had clear goals for Chrome, simplicity, speed, and security. We had to solve some significant technical challenges along the way. For example, we set a goal to speed up JavaScript by an order of magnitude. At launch, our V8 engine was 20 times faster than anything else out there. It could power the next generation of web applications. To deliver on security, we built a multi-process architecture that kept tabs isolated in a sandbox. This prevented apps from crashing one another and protected against malware. I would love to tell you that Chrome was an immediate success when we launched in 2008. It wasn't. We had to figure out how to scale the product. It taught me that working through setbacks is an important part of success. By the time Chrome launched in 2008, there was another shift happening in computing to smartphones and the mobile web. A few years later, I was asked to oversee Android. Google's mobile operating system. Android started with the goal of bringing open standards to the mobile industry. And like Chrome, it was a large open platform that was growing very fast. Because of that openness, today it's the most popular mobile operating system in the world. We saw the potential for Android to help 1 billion people access the internet for the first time. 
In 2017, we launched Android Go to bring the power of Android to entry-level smartphones. Today, Android Go helps hundreds of thousands of people throughout their day. Recently, we partnered with Reliance Geo to make an operating system specifically for the Indian market. The Pragati OS runs on an affordable smartphone that puts technology within reach for millions more Indians. Chrome and Android are two examples of how engineering insights have helped us bring computing to more people. Now, computing is experiencing another shift, this time to AI. I believe AI is the most profound technology humanity is working on, as important as electricity or fire. For a decade, we've been laying the foundation with the investments in deep areas of computer science, including advancements in speech recognition, translation, and computer vision. We started working on tensor processing units, the specialized hardware that could give us and everyone the compute power to fuel these projects. And in 2016, we pivoted the company to AI first to better harness this opportunity. Already, AI is making our products more helpful. It's what enables people to translate languages with Google Translate have a conversation in a foreign language through the Google Assistant, or search visually using Google Lens. It's also improving the company's original moonshot, Search. Our latest system, MAM, is 1,000 times more powerful than our previous system and will open up searches across video, audio, and images in addition to text. As a next step, we are focused on how to make computing converse in more natural and meaningful ways. Advances in language understanding are moving us closer to computing that is more immersive, ambient, and helpful anytime and anywhere you need it. We are equally excited by the potential for AI to have a positive impact on complex challenges. Already, AI can help cities understand the sources of carbon emissions that contribute to climate change and give doctors better tools to screen for disease. In India specifically, we worked with Aravind High Hospital and Sankara Netralaya to build an algorithm which screens for diabetic retinopathy. It's also where we first piloted our AI-powered flood forecast systems. This year, these systems have sent out over 115 million alerts, covering areas with 360 million people worldwide. India was also where we developed Bolo, an AI-powered app that helps children read. It's now called Read Along, and it's available in 180 countries. I remember seeing a classroom of children using the app to learn to read in Hindi. It drove home for me how AI can help people gain knowledge about the world around them. And we are still only in the early stages of what's possible. Google engineers are creating AI models that can handle thousands of tasks at once. And our quantum computing researchers are working on a computer that can simulate molecules with promising new approaches to complex challenges. None of these achievements would be possible without the engineering mindset, the curiosity to seek out new ideas, the skill to make them real, and the impatience to drive them forward. Engineering is part of who I am, just as India is part of who I am. I carry both within me, and they form the lens through which I strive to make an impact on the world. So thank you again for this recognition, and I hope to be able to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pichai. I now invite Professor Susmita Surkole, Professor and Head Advanced Computing and Microelectronics Unit, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. Hello. Good morning. Today we will talk about physical design automation for electronic and quantum circuits. The agenda is a brief introduction uh, and then the design cycle and focus on the physical design problems, particularly floor planning and custom ASICs and field programmable gate arrays. And then we move on to the recent topic of design for manufacturability and its effect on physical design, especially with next generation lithography. The second part, I will briefly touch upon the work we've been doing 
with respect to physical, physical design for quantum circuits, which have gained a lot of importance. And finally, some concluding remarks. So for the IC design and test flow, we start with the design specification and then produce the IC design, which therefore then is um, sent to the fab, fabrication facility, uh, where after the wafer is, uh, the fabrication has been done, uh, it is tested and assembled, that is packaged. And finally, uh, the customer for a wide variety of um, applications uses different kinds of ICs. The design automation flow goes as follows that with the system specification, uh, first the behavioral representation leads to the architectural design followed by the functional design and the logic design but for electronic circuits or digital logic if you wish even for analog circuits so, which is converted to structural representation that is in terms of the circuit blocks, the, the elements that you have. And finally, the geometric representation and the physical representation, which is known as the physical design. It comprises of partitioning, the billions of transistors that we have nowadays, then floor planning, which is the rough placement, followed by the absolute placement or relative placement, followed by absolute placement, and then routing of various kinds of signals, such as clock, power and ground, which are uh, almost all over uh, the chip. Finally, the signals uh, that actually are relevant to the computation that is required uh, to be done by the system. The timing has to be uh, met so that the system specification uh, is satisfied. Physical verification so that uh, design rules are not, layout design rules are not violated. Only then, uh, the layout post-processing of producing masks and <clears throat> through lithography and fabrication is done and finally packaging and testing. There are different types of IC layout design styles uh, going from full custom standard cell gate array to the field programmable gate array or FPGAs. Uh, full custom has high cost but very high performance and a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, sizes, types, and places, and interconnections, whereas FPGAs are the least uh, flexible, uh, but they're used for rapid prototyping, and uh, nowadays uh, they are there for all kinds of uh, mobile communication applications, crypto processes, and so on. Uh, our focus has been on <clears throat> algorithm development for floor planning, <clears throat> placement, and routing. I will just briefly touch upon <clears throat> some of our works on floor plan generation for both the ASICs or custom chips as well as FPGAs. And then some work, recent work on uh, next generation lithography, particularly extreme ultraviolet lithography for uh, meeting some of the challenges that uh, come up with this sort of lithography. So in ASICS, uh, we are given a circuit, uh, the, the structural representation, the vertices uh, in, as a graph, the vertices correspond to the, um, uh, the, the active elements in the structure, namely gates or at whatever level you have. And the <clears throat> edges between two vertices uh, correspond to the interconnections between them. So from the graph, um, by graph theoretic methods, graph algorithmic methods, we get on to the rectangular floor plan by the dualization, graph dualization method, uh, which is on the rightmost uh, figure over here. Uh, this has some uh, characterization of what kinds of graphs will yield proper floor plans. We came up with some uh, theoretical results and use that to build a tool for uh, which uh, which takes uh, the set of modules with the choices of shapes and connectivity graph and the output is uh, the um, floor plan with the minimum wasted uh, space and wire length uh, it is it comprises of two phases a top-down topology generation uh, using and graph search and a bottom-up sizing, that is uh, choosing the actual shape which will give the optimal floor plan. 
It is done by recursive bipartitioning. Uh, uh, so the bi each bipartition corresponds to a cut, either a straight line or what is known as a Z cut, if you have a non-sliceable floor plan. And then the sizing part is bottom up where uh, the, the two children of a node are combined, depending on the direction of the cut, and the corresponding shape is chosen for those two children so that the overall um, bounding box has minimum wasted space. Corresponding to a particular floor plan by partition tree, there is uh, a unique uh, circuit graph, but the other direction is not. And there are maybe exponential number of floor plans corresponding to a particular um, circuit graph. Therefore, uh, the floor planning problem is a computationally expensive problem. And among the floor plan uh, trees, um, many floor plan trees, we want to find the optimal one. So that's why we apply and our graph search to come up with the uh, best floor plan tree and then perform optimal sizing on it. Here is an illustration of our efficient and scalable method. Um, the left one is the graph, the top right one is the floor plan, the shaded boxes are where the wasted spaces are, uh, and the one on the bot bottom, uh, part C, uh, shows the cuts, the straight line cuts or the Z cuts, which were generated by the bipartitions. Now let's move on to uh, physical design of FPGAs, uh, the design flow, particularly for physical design, you have floor planning, placement, and routing. But uh, here, uh, the, the sizes and shapes of the blocks are uh, predetermined, and uh, therefore, um, and the positions are also predetermined. So, therefore, the floor planning problem is somewhat different over here. And uh, what we uh, worked on is that suppose I have one particular circuit graph, uh, which has been mapped onto the uh, specific resources available on a given FPGA. How do I do the floor plan for the functional modules, which comprise of a number of such uh, circuit elements? We came up with a deterministic algorithm, which uh, has three phases, phases, recursive min cut partition, and then unified topology generation and sizing. And of course, um, it gave us a huge speed up and uh, considerable improvement in uh, wire length over existing work. If I extend this to multiple instances for uh, which is uh, used in partial reconfigurability, then there are some blocks which are common. They are known as the static module. So we fix them first. And then when we do the floor planning for all the instances taken together, we would like to minimize the reconfiguration overhead. And we were successful in doing that. The progress of miniaturization in CMOS technology has led to uh, um, the in lithography use of uh, uh, laser with a wavelength much larger than actual feature size. This is known as the sub wavelength lithography gap and as a result when the wave of this printed pattern is distorted in different ways there are different techniques but all of them uh, as far as optical lithography is concerned uh, have some um, uh, limitations in terms of very high mass cost and, and violation of design rules, etc. So that led to next generation lithography. Uh, the main one nowadays is extreme ultraviolet lithography, which uses a, a wavelength of 13.5 nanometer. But the difficulty is that for, for these small wavelength ones, we need clear field mask. Um, otherwise, it gets absorbed by the mask. And here, there is a, a Another phenomenon, instead of pattern distortion due to uh, diffusion, what we have is a flare effect uh, because of reflection and scattering of these uh, of these particular extra uh, extreme ultraviolet rays. Uh, and so we need to reduce flare; otherwise, it is going to co it causes um, distortion. Other uh, common next generation lithography is electron beam lithography. It does not have mask. So it is advantageous, but uh, it is very slow. 
So it led to multiple uh, E-beams, which is parallel stripes are written by different E-beams. So there is a problem of uh, distortion at the stitching line, which needs to be solved. We, we have worked on both uh, physical design for both times. So I'll just uh, talk about flare aware um, or flare reduction in uh, uh, the layout uh, for EUVL uh, produced masks. And we could achieve 26% reduction by reassigning some of the wire segments in a, co a complete layout by traditional method so that <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the pattern density is such uh, distributed such that the flare overall flare as we see in the rightmost column the heat map of the flare map is very small uh, the in the um, left half we have the pattern density map and in the right half we have the flare map let's move on to quantum circuits and uh, associated uh, physical design issues over there uh, the major drivers for quantum circuits were uh, uh, certain algorithms had exponential speed up and hardware limitations of uh, uh, CMOS technology uh, was uh, a major uh, hurdle and uh, power consumption for large scale integration was uh, also a serious issue whereas quantum circuits have reversibility leading to uh, almost no uh, uh, dissipation for um, computation. We worked on optimization methods for synthesis on linear, linear nearest neighbor technology independent architecture for multi-valued uh, quantum logic and uh, then uh, uh, multi-valued quantum error correction code, uh, specifically physical design aware quantum circuit synthesis and recently circuit optimization for um, approximation algorithms in quantum and machine learning based uh, syndrome decoding um, here. So if we talk about uh, the flow, um, apart from logic synthesis, we have to do um, place and route. And why is that? Because uh, we would like to place the uh, computing units, which are known as qubits on a 2D array. Uh, and uh, if this is the logic circuit, the, uh, what we have shown here are two input gates known as C-naught gates. Uh, for example, the first one uh, operates on Q0 on top and Q5 uh, on bottom. From left to right, these straight, uh, horizontal lines are, represent time, uh, not wires. Uh, so the trivial mapping of the qubits, the six qubits onto the 2D array, as we uh, have shown uh, at the um, bottommost row uh, leads to a lot of uh, swapping operations required so that the two particular inputs for a particular operation are in neighboring positions in the 2D array. So this mapping that we started with uh, has uh, a cost of six because there are six swaps. However, there exists an optimized mapping uh, which needs only one swap operation. So therefore, the physical uh, design problem is how can we do this mapping or placing of, the, so there's the placement problem on the 2D grid of locations of other qubits and then build the swap chains with the minimum number of swaps. Uh, in our um, algorithm that we proposed, we could achieve 31% reduction in cost for the benchmarks on an average and it took just a few seconds as opposed to uh, the existing ones where um, it could not handle large ones. So in conclusion, uh, I've given a brief glimpse of the optimization algorithms required. There are many more challenges uh, remaining for nanometer technology uh, where we have hybrid mode and in quantum circuit where uh, noisy intermediate scale circuits had additional um, resource constraints. I would like to acknowledge my key collaborators and thank you for your attention. Any questions I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Professor Kohle. I now invite Professor Devdeep Mukhopadhyay, Professor, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Welcome to this talk entitled as Hardware Security in the Modern World from Things to Cloud. Myself, Devdeep Mukhopadhyay, I'm working as a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Kharagpur. 
The domain of my research is in the area of hardware security, which tries to address the gap between cryptographic theory and cryptography in practice. So here is an illustration of a classic crypto system where Alice and Bob are communicating over an untrusted channel. So we all know that the existing theory of cryptography, while it tries to give guarantees of several important requirements like confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it has limitations because of which, and because of the fact that there is an absence of theory for the reality, even mathematically strong ciphers leak in the real world through information sources, which are called as side channels. So to hit the context, why designing secure cryptographic systems are difficult, let us talk about a theoretical statement which says that there is a group in which a discrete lock problem or DLP is hard. Now DLP is a candidate hard, hard problem in computer science around which several theoretical crypto systems have been constructed. However, in practice, we need a concrete instantiation, a very popular form of which is the ECDLP or the elliptic curve discrete lock problem. Now during this translation from theory to practice, it has been encountered that there are several attacks that break real world ECC even without trying to solve the ECDLP problem. Often the problem is in the implementation of these crypto systems, which opens up avenues for attacks. So in theory, theory and practice are same, but in practice they are not. And this leads us to this fascinating world or journey from theory to practice, which has been the core area of my research, trying to translate seamlessly the theoretical guarantees into concrete secure instances. So in order to achieve this, I set up this laboratory at IIT Kharagpur, which we called as Secured Embedded Architecture Lab or abbreviated as Seal Lab to work on several uh, aspects on attacks and counter methods. To give a very quick overview, we started with VLSI of crypto systems, formal verifications for such complex circuits, site chain analysis and countermeasures. We are recently working on translating complex post-quantum crypto algorithms into implementations, micro-architectural attacks, Trojan designs and detections, physically unclonable functions, IoT security, machine learning for attacks and defenses, and finally, cyber physical system security. This lab has graduated 12 PhD students who are now in key positions around the world. And we have also collaborated with several industrial partners and academic institutes in several interesting research problems. So to start with, my uh, research in this direction has start, had started with the development of AES around 2001. Uh, and we know that AES uh, gradually uh, from the algorithm Reindal developed by two young Belgian uh, cryptographers uh, was chosen as a standard. And, and now it is, it is used worldwide as the standard crypto system. It is used in several consumer products, modern processors and so on. So it was a natural question when we talk about crypto implementations to see that while the algorithm is strong, whether the implementations opens up avenues for attacks. And in this context, we look at side channels. In particular, in my research, I had tried to look at a type of attack which are called as fault attacks. So this faulty perspective of looking at crypto systems gave me several opportunities of finding out attacks on crypto algorithms. In particular, uh, in our laboratory, we have state-of-the-art uh, facilities for performing attacks using laser guns, electromagnetic radiations, uh, voltage fluctuations, clock glitches, and so on. I would like to highlight, the, we also worked on a technique which is based on an attack which is called as row hammers, which tries to exploit a vulnerability in the DRAM chips and show that one can develop software-driven attacks to launch fault attacks, both on block ciphers as well as public key algorithms. So what are fault-based script analysis? So here is a quick overview behind fault-based script analysis. So as you can see, that we take a plain text and we obtain a fault-free cipher text. In another run of the encryption, we perform changes in the environmental conditions, which leads to a fault induction, and that creates a faulty cipher text. The objective of the attacker is now to analyze this faulty cipher text along with the fault-free cipher text to obtain the secret. So here is an example of how the fault attack works in a popular AES algorithm. As you can see that the fault propagates around the cipher, and if you observe, then you will see that because of the various transformations inside the cipher, the fault starts to behave, uh, be a, you know, like lead to interrelationships, as you can see over here, which are exploited by the attacker. So the attacker now tries to kind of guess the key and see that whether these attacks are maintained. And using this, they try to develop our cryptanalytic technique. 
So in one of our works, we developed the strongest fault attack reported on literature on the AES algorithm, showing that a single fault is enough to compromise the AES key, reducing to it around a paltry 256 values with a, with a time complexity, which is pretty much practical and achievable in real life. And a double shot, shot can uniquely retrieve the key. Because of the efficiency of this fault attack, uh, which has essentially withstood for around more than 10 years, uh, this work has been cited in several instances of following research and uh, has led to several newer forms of attacks which uses in the core this attack technique. We have recently tried to develop fault attacks to even break countermeasures. A very popular form of countermeasure for site channel analysis are what are called as the threshold implementations. Now, threshold implementations are a technique which is based on multi-party computations and secret sharing, which tries to kind of uh, you know, divide the inputs into several shares, ensuring that the power consumption, for instance, doesn't depend upon the actual data. So however, we developed a technique at Eurocrypt in 2020, which is which are called as fault template attacks, where we showed that if you target the faults where on the mask values, that is the shares, then one can develop templates, which are nothing but noting that whether the fault is propagated to the output or not. Now this data depend this leads to certain data dependencies through which you can perform a fault template attack to obtain the secret key. So this was the first reported fault template attack to break these countermeasures and was published at Eurocrypt and also ICCAD, which are two premier conferences on cryptography and also on design automation. We are also working on fault tolerant architectures. It is an industrial relevant industrially relevant problem to see that whether one can understand or analyze the leakage against this class of attacks without really seeing what is internal to the architecture, because many times they are proprietary and designers are not confident about opening them. So we developed a DAC 2019 as the first technique of developing a fault template, I mean, a fault uh, analysis or fault assessment technique uh, using statistical hypothesis testing and showed that one can develop a block, black box approach to understand the, 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 the leakage. We also try to show that there are information theoretic correspondences of this particular evaluation method. So finally, we try to wrap all this stuff, stuff together and develop an open source platform for site channel evaluation, which we called as ESP on Veshak, which we try to also commercialize using our uh, entrepreneurship at IIT Kharag. Subsequently, uh, we also try to look at micro architectural attacks, which tries to address the gap between hardware and software. So these attacks largely targets the software which are running on our general purpose computing systems because of the underlying hardware architectures. Now, one of the things that I would like to stress is that computer architecture has largely evolved with performance as a key objective. And therefore there has been several artifacts which has been developed, which often op opens up opportunities of attacks. In particular, this attack, which is which are called as Spectre and Meltdown shows that it is very difficult to patch them because patching them means like going back 20 years of evolution of the computing systems. So this leads us to a gap and therefore we need a holistic approach to develop and model these information leakages also taking care of the underlying architecture. So we had the first reported results on trying to look at several architectural uh, artifacts to start with the cache the cache memory. We all know that the cache memory is a fast form of memory, which sits between the microprocessor and the main memory trying to bridge it. And we also know that if there is a cache hit, the access time is less. And if the cache means, if there's a cache miss, then access time is high. So now the question is right, whether such timing channels can be used potentially for performing attack. But there is a very famous attack due to uh, Dan Bernstein, which shows that a cache timing attack can work even on a remote server. The idea is that a remote attacker tries to kind of send packets over a network where the, or to a server, which is running encryption software, and by observing the timing of encryption, perform statistical tests. So in the core, this attack works by observing the AES and looking at the timing characteristic of the particular encryption process. In particular, it tries to put a key, like a zero key and obtain a timing characteristic. And for the unknown key, it again obtains timing characteristics and then perform correlation it stands out that a correlation easily reveals the key. So why does the attack work? So we looked at the underlying principle of this attack and showed that this attack works really largely because of the nice distribution of cache misses that you obtain. 
And this leads us to the question that while this attack works for such kind of implementations on OpenASL or standard cryptographic libraries, does this attack still works when you implement the AES algorithm with a smaller table size? The reason why I tell that is because when you have a smaller table implementation of the AES algorithm, then because of the small table, after a few accesses to the table, the, 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 the entire table uh, gets loaded into the cache and therefore you do not get this nice uh, differences of cache misses. So that's why you see that the number of cache misses becomes constant and therefore it was widely believed that cache attacks are difficult. There were reported literature to show that cache attacks are difficult on such kind of ciphered instances. However, we were the first time we showed that cache attacks are still possible on ciphers with small S boxes and try to relate it to the underlying architecture. In fact, we showed that because of the various features in modern day architectures like out of, uh, out of order execution and also like in parallel handling the cache misses, these kind of ciphers which are implemented with small S boxes are still vulnerable. So in one of our collaborations with Entity Labs in Japan, we showed for the first time that one can compromise ciphers like Clefia, which were designed by Sony corporations with 256 byte tables and hence small S boxes, are still vulnerable and can leak the entire 120 bit key using these attacks in around 300 seconds. In particular, we showed that these attacks potentially do not work on older systems, maybe because of the absence of such kind of modern features. We went ahead and also looked at the other artifacts in the, around the cache memory, which can also lead to such kind of vulnerabilities. In particular, we showed for the first time that hardware prefetches, which are often used for performance improvement, also lead to leakage. We tried to model the information leakage due to two important prefetching techniques, like sequential prefetchers and arbitrary style prefetchers, and compared their leakages and showed that our models very accurately are able to measure the leakage as well as the timing profile of uh, under such experiments. So this paper was published in the prestigious uh, Journal of Cryptology. Uh, subsequently, we also looked at uh, other uh, artifacts, for instance, the branch predictor. Uh, uh, so the idea was that we try, we do not like for, uh, for systems like Intel, we often do not know what is the underlying uh, branch predictor architecture. So therefore, right, we started with some very simplistic assumptions of what are called as two-bit predictors and three-bit predictors and showed that with such simple models, one is able to develop attacks which can compromise standard ciphers like RSA and elliptic curves. In particular, in this attack, we try to use the branch prediction or the branch misprediction uh, statistics, which are obtained from performance monitoring units where like hardware performance counters and showed that these attacks works. So our works were one of the foremost to show that performance counters can lead to security vulnerabilities. Interestingly, now performance counters are prohibited and the, the access is made, uh, you know, like you need a root privilege to access such performance counters. So we also went ahead and showed that these attacks are also powerful to break countermeasures. And in fact, in one of our works, we showed that even standard cards can be compromised even when they have randomization techniques and hence protections. So this work was selected for the feature as a feature paper by the editorial board of IEEE transactions on computers. In another direction of work, we try to look at the security and privacy in the context of IoT. So we know that IoTs can potentially can revolutionize the quality of life, but they have serious security issues. Many of the reasons why they have like the security issues is because of the absence of classical authentication techniques, mainly because of the cost and the resource constraint of such devices. So what we try to look at is whether puffs or physically unclonable functions can be can be can be can be uh, you know like can be made to work as a promising tool for security in such contexts. So what are puffs? So puffs are fingerprints of the device. The idea being is that if you take a puff circuit and you implement them on these devices, because of the underlying device physics, the same challenge, although being applied across all to, to these de devices, the responses obtained are statistically independent. So we wanted to develop protocols which can be used to authenticate using such kind of hardware primitives. So while puffs can reduce the cost and raise the security, there was a major point of using puffs for authentication because of the fact that puffs are unclonable, you at the verified end cannot have a copy of the puff and therefore one needs to store the challenge responses in the form of a table. Now this leads to a major point of attack and also makes this invisible for real life applications. In one of our collaborations with Wipro, we showed and developed 
the first protocol using paths, which do not need to explicitly store the challenge responses in the, at the server end. In this, in this particular uh, collaboration, we showed that one can use these con constructions and protect against various attacks on standard IoT systems like video surveillance camera. And we also showed that this uh, algorithms or protocols can work with minimal footprint on power and time. Now to conclude, I will talk briefly about our works on the other end of the IoT, which is essentially on what we call as searchable encryption on the cloud. We know that there are various kinds of information which are getting onto the cloud. And the question is, right, how do we keep them private? So the objective here is to develop a technique which we call as searchable symmetric encryption. So the idea is that if there is a client which has got the data, who owns the data, and using a small cryptographic key encrypts and outsources this data to the server. And later on, when it wants to search, it takes its query and also encrypts it, which we called as the encrypted query token. So now on the server, the encrypted data is processed along with the encrypted query token and the outcome is obtained. So the server essentially doesn't learn anything about, uh, or ideally should not learn anything out of this process. So at crypto in 2013, there was a very famous paper which tries to develop the most efficient technique for performing conjunctive searches on keywords like W1 and W2 and so on to say WN, which are the keywords. However, it was shown that this is vulnerable against a very pop, very strong form of attack, which are called as file injection attacks. So this was an open problem, which we tried to address and solve. In our paper at CCS 2018, we showed that one can develop a primitive which is called as hidden vector encryption. And using it, we can develop a technique which is called as H tag, which can, use a, which can be used to perform conjunctive searches efficiently without being vulnerable to such dangerous file injection attacks. So in this work, we showed that one can perform or, you know, like a search on around 60 GB of data in a time which is around less than one second. So, so later on, so before I uh, conclude, here is a quick, uh, demonstration of our system. encrypted files and as you can see that based on the search one can obtain the encrypted files which you can download at your end and you can and you can you can you can obtain access so what we try to ensure is that the server learns no information about the actual content or also about what is being searched for. so as a future direction in our work we try to kind of uh, look at a very uh, pressing problem of our modern day world in india for example because we know that India is one of the major importers of hardware devices. And therefore one of the major concerns is whether our hardware is trustworthy. So we try to develop both intrusive methods as well as non-intrusive methods to see that whether uh, we can you know, like perform forensics on the hardware. So likewise, we are also working in another direction which is also very challenging, which is on trying to see whether we can enable fully homomorphic encryption, which is a holy grail in computing allowing arbitrary computation on data. However, it is largely inefficient, and therefore we are trying to see whether we can develop an e efficient and also implement them in a leakage resilient manner for fully homomorphic schemes, so, uh, which, which can you know, like open, uh, open or make, make several applications possible, like biometric authentications, medical analysis, and so on. So to conclude, hardware security in IoT is of utmost importance in the modern society, and we need to develop expertise in several domains in this, in this area. And IoT provides us several heterogeneous endpoints and therefore different types of attack surfaces. And therefore one needs to develop several types of uh, defense mechanisms. We strive to develop novel tools and solutions for site channel security, design new hardware primitives for end-to-end -end IoT security. Because it is very important to keep this in mind that a chain is no stronger than its weakest link. And therefore we need to develop different kinds of solution to address 
security as a, in a holistic manner. So we also have uh, tried to contribute to the pedagogical development of hardware security by, by writing one of the foremost books on hardware security, uh, timing channels in cryptography, and also fault tolerance in cryptography. And this is a MOOC course that we run on hardware security. And uh, with this, I would like to say thank you with this uh, comment that every computation leaks, and this is the prime motivation behind our research. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Debdeep. I now invite Dr. Ramachandran Ramji, Senior Principal Researcher, Microsoft Research India. Hi, I'm Ram Ramji, a researcher at Microsoft Research India. I would like to thank the Indian National Academy of Engineering for inviting me to give this talk. In this talk, I will highlight a few of the projects from my research career. In this talk, I will briefly cover three research projects, Nerisel, Coconut, and Gandiva, that span three areas in computer systems, namely mobile systems, network systems, and systems for deep learning. Let me start with the Nerisel project. In 2007, I had just moved to Bangalore from the US to join Microsoft Research India. And the first thing that hit me is the chaotic traffic, the potholes and speed bumps, frequent acceleration and braking, liberal honking, a variety of vehicle types and chaotic intersections that left one census overwhelmed. But we also thought that if we can capture this rich information in a map, that would be very useful. But for this, one needed to go beyond just GPS-based vehicle tracking. Our key insight was that perhaps we could use smartphones and piggyback on them to collect this information as the user went about their daily lives. While this idea might seem obvious today, let us go back to 2007 when we started this project. The smartphones then were bulky devices with very limited capabilities. Even in the developed world, there were less than 5% of penetration of smartphones. And in India, of course, the number was well below 1%. The iPhone original version was released sometime in June 2007, well after we started this project. However, we assumed or rather imagined a future world where everyone would be carrying their smartphones. Not only that, we also had to assume that the smartphones in the future will be much more capable than they were at that time and would have a variety of sensors that would allow us to capture the rich information that we needed. To simulate that future, we ended up collect, connecting external sensors like the one shown in this picture here, an accelerometer sensor, and we connected these and rigged them up together in a clunky prototype over which we built the Nerisal system. Of course, imagining that the future, all this would be in a single device. Um, the key thing that allowed us to collect this rich information was the programmability of the platform. Uh, we built lots of new features on this system, including the virtual reorientation of the phone. So the user may be carrying the phone in their back or in their back pocket, and we wanted to be able to reorient the phone so that we can measure acceleration, etc., correctly. And we did that without using a compass or a gyro that was unavailable at that time. We built uh, features like triggered sensing, where we would use a low power sensor like an accelerometer to turn on and off a high energy usage sensor like a GPS. We uh, did location tracking using cellular towers to get some coarse grain information and only turned on the energy hungry GPS only when necessary. We built statistical filters and simple machine learning models for detecting road bumps, potholes, honking, and so on. In summary, we built an energy frugal nerisal system that could collect a whole bunch of rich information opportunistically on smartphones. And as the smartphone usage took off, our idea also took off. 
Other researchers started working on using smartphone sensors for a variety of other applications, and consequently, the Nerissal paper that we published in 2008 received a lot of interest and citations. In parallel, various startups took off in the space, including Waze, which tackled the problem of rich traffic sensing, ZenDrive, Cambridge Mobile Telematics, and others who focused on sensing driving behavior with applications to insurance and so on and so forth. And in 2009, ACM Sig Mobile selected the Nerissal paper for its test of time award and recognized the paper had a lasting impact on the field of mobile systems, for which we are very grateful. So that was mobile systems. We will now look at network systems in the context of the coconut project. So when I started this in 2009, large enterprises were facing a dilemma. They were consolidating servers in a few data centers to save management costs, but had to suffer poor performance because of the constraints on the wide area network bandwidth and latency. Note that even today, after 10 plus years when we started this project, the problem still remains. Enterprises have moved from their servers from data centers to the cloud, but the wide area network is still bandwidth and latency constraints compared to local area networks, and the problem still remains relevant. At that time, middle box based WAN optimizers were the preferred solution to address this problem. These were powerful boxes that you deploy at two ends of the bandwidth constraint link, and they would optimize usage on that link by compressing traffic flowing through them. At one point, the revenue from these boxes exceeded over a billion dollars every year, so they were extremely popular. But there were several issues as well. First was security. These boxes had to see all the traffic in the clear, so you could not encrypt the traffic end to end or you have to share the keys with these boxes, which breaks all security principles. Second, these boxes did not help the resource constrained wireless links like 3G or 4G because they were sitting in the middle and couldn't help the end devices. And third, cost, these boxes were expensive. So our thought was that why can't we do this service purely in software on the end devices themselves? And that way, we can avoid the security problem because you could always compress and then encrypt. You can help resource constrained wireless links because these things can run on the end smartphones as well. And you solve the hardware based cost issue. But the question is, can you do all this in efficiently in software and get the gains that these middle boxes were able to get? And Coconut was our answer to this problem. Coconut is a fast redundancy elimination system that runs on end hosts. The way it works is we maintain synchronized dictionaries on the fly at both ends. And we develop new chunking and hashing algorithms to identify fragments as small as 32 bytes, which are redundant, and eliminate them. This approach we showed could capture over 80% of the bandwidth savings of the middle boxes. And given the increased end-to-end -end security needs today, the middle box based WAN optimizer that we saw in the previous slide has virtually disappeared from the market today. And the only solutions that are available are secure end-to-end software-based solutions. And as I said, the problem is remains relevant, and this idea has influenced a variety of Microsoft products over the years, starting with uh, the remote desktop application in Windows 8, and a whole bunch of services in Azure that needs to traverse a bandwidth constraint link on the wide area network. Finally, I will present Gandiva, a system for optimizing deep learning. When you look at how AI or deep learning training is accomplished today, these deep learning jobs require expensive hardware such as graphics processing unit or GPUs or other dedicated custom hardware. And these jobs holds onto this hardware exclusively until its completion. The implicit assumption behind this approach is that all deep learning jobs 
or long running that is takes hours or days and have the same priority while some jobs are indeed long running there are a whole bunch of other types of jobs too for example when a scientist is developing a new model prototyping or debugging requires inter interactive access and they may be using something like a jupyter notebook for a few hours and there are also other types of jobs such as auto ml or hyperparameter jobs where early feedback may be critical and sub jobs may be need to run on low priority with a mix of job types and priorities today's schedulers are very inefficient and that is why ai training is very expensive one might even say that we are in the mainframe era as regards ai computing so what can we do better uh, the key insight when we started this project was we started looking at the characteristics of these jobs and there was a unique pattern that we saw so here are two plots both showing gpu memory used versus time while these jobs are training the one on the left shows a resnet vision based model running on the imagenet data set the one on the right shows a language translation model running on the natural language data sets. And what is clear from these graphs is that the memory usage has a very periodic pattern. And this pattern is what is called a mini batch where the memory usage grows and then shrinks. And the difference between the high and low memory usage points can be as much as 77x. So the key idea in Gandhiva is can we use this characteristic to move jobs in and out of the hardware when the memory usage is low? That way we can efficiently take jobs in and out and make much better use of the system. So we built up on this idea two mechanisms. The first is time slicing. So the way it works is as follows. Uh, the scheduler would tell the framework to suspend a job which would then wait for the mini batch completion so that the memory usage can become low and then copy the small state from the GPU to the CPU, thereby freeing up the GPU for another job. The overhead of suspending a job is roughly 50 to 250 milliseconds and compared to hours that these jobs take, this is very, very efficient. And once you have this mechanism, you can support the variety of applications we talked about, including interactive Jupyter notebooks, uh, auto ML, where you can get five times faster convergence and fairness to GPS usage, where, you know, users are not just waiting in the queue endlessly getting waiting for the jobs to get scheduled. And the other interesting aspect is once you suspend the job in the CPU, you could checkpoint it to disk and migrate the job anywhere across the whole cluster and that gives you an amazing superpower because once the job can move anywhere in the cluster it opens a plethora of opportunities for improving the efficiency of the system basically what your operating system can do to processes on a laptop today we can now do on a cluster with tens of thousands of gpus so we can do things like packing, where we can run multiple small jobs together on the same hardware. We can defragment cluster so that a large job, which takes tons of GPUs, we could give them GPUs which are physically close by, so the job's efficiency is much better. We can support heterogeneity automatically. That is, when a job comes, we can find the best match hardware for that job, we can support a variety of priority levels. So if somebody is doing some low priority training, they can use preemptible nodes and that way do that training at a very low cost. We can support fault tolerance, you know, because we take these checkpoints. If there are machine failures, we can automatically let the jobs recover from those failures. We can support elasticity. That is the jobs can grow and shrink to use the right number of GPUs that are available. We can do maintenance of the servers and whole bunch of things very, very efficiently. So in summary, with respect to AI infrastructure, one can think of 
a cluster at the bottom with a whole bunch of variety of different hardware. On top of it, Gandiva enhances the software frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch with efficient time slicing and migration mechanisms. And on top, Gandiva is a fair and efficient scheduler to schedule these jobs on this cluster. So that to the scientist that submits deep learning jobs, the system appears serverless. Uh, they just submit their job, the job runs anywhere in that cluster at the lowest cost and returns the trained model to the user, hiding all the complexity of fault tolerance, efficiency, and so on. So in conclusion, in this talk, I covered three projects, Nerisil, a mobile system that collects rich information on road and traffic conditions by piggybacking on smartphones. I then described Coconut, a fast software-based end-to-end network traffic redundancy elimination system that can make efficient use of bandwidth constraint links. I finally described Gandhiva, a scheduler for improving efficiency of training deep learning jobs. I hope this talk has given you a flavor of the rich variety of research problems in computer systems and their potential for impact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramji. I invite Dr. Gautam Shroff, SVP and Head, TCS Research, Gurgaon. Okay, thank you for that uh, introduction and for inviting me for this uh, meeting. Right, so there's a, obviously there's a lot of buzz. Uh, every year we have a hype cycle uh, uh, and AI has its own hype cycle and some things are uh, new and some things are becoming old. Uh, and there's a lot of hype. Clearly, the news, uh, the uh, clickbait on, uh, uh, on on your phones, it's all you know. It's all uh, was all about AI uh, till the pandemic hit, and now of course been overshadowed by uh, perhaps more pressing things. Uh, and but you know, even otherwise, there have been a lot of expectations. So there were many many panels set up uh, by the government. I was uh, on one of the first one of them. They were submitting a report uh, way back, a couple two two and a half years back, uh, I think. Uh, and then there were many other panels after that. Uh, many expectations on how it would change uh, things uh, drastically, uh, perhaps uh, exaggerated expectations at some point. And also many fears. One fear was jobs, which we sort of addressed in our report a bit. Another fear was uh, global, whether we would have robot killer weapons. And I was on a panel at the UN where we were trying to uh, uh, regulate these things, but obviously uh, not every country wanted to regulate it. Uh, but then anyway, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of uh, expectation and fear. But the reality, I think, uh, in, a, in a sort of a considered view is uh, rather different. And I'll, uh, I'll now turn to a few uh, uh, examples. So what does AI actually allow, to allow people to do, or allow machines to do? I mean, let's just get to the basics. There's this, uh, AI really started off with sort of good old fashioned AI, uh, which is all about logic and logical reasoning. And uh, it's been put aside in some sense these days, people aren't looking at it enough, but uh, as I'll explain, it's, it's getting more and more important. Uh, even the, uh, the uh, uh, gurus of deep learning are now realizing the benefits of uh, some of these things. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, secondly, of course, machine learning and deep learning have uh, had their remarkable successes in perception, recognizing things, images, faces, etc. Uh, processing natural language. I won't use the word understanding, but certainly processing natural language uh, to, to, to clean uh, and extract information from it. And then, uh, you know, decision making, uh, predicting, not, not decision making, but say predicting things in the future, predicting what people will do, predicting how many things will be bought or what will happen uh, to, the, uh, to a machine and things like that. So the, the deep learning has been extremely good at this. Uh, and lastly, decision making. Uh, reinforcement learning has uh, helped us do these things. Now, if you don't understand all these things, it's fine. I know the audience is broad and vast, uh, and perhaps many of you do. But this is the broad, uh, and I'll just go through a couple of examples of each of these uh, and talk about how the, the things change uh, uh, in the current scenario. Okay, so let's start with logical reasoning and perception. So there are two schools of thought here are schools of, or approaches. 
one is uh, you have logical reasoning and you have perception which is best done through deep learning and of course the core fundamental ai question is how does logical reasoning actually arise from perception and i don't think we have a great answer but we're trying to get there but the point i wanted to make is these are two very different questions for example let's take a look at this is a very simple problem that men by uh, understanding familiar relationships from deep learning way of doing this would be just give you know give a machine learning model thousands and thousands of such examples and answers and it should figure out not only how to parse a sentence and understand what it's trying to say but also understand the whole set of possible familiar relationships second coming cousins mama as chachas etc which come in the corpus and if something was not in the corpus then you know the machine learning method would not work would not understand it the other way of doing it would be to say look if for example if you had a logical reasoning engine you could easily solve this with almost exact accuracy provided you were able to parse the sentence to get the logical facts out so that's logical reasoning plus perception would do a great job but trying to get the logical reasoning out from the perception directly we still haven't done it yet there is obviously lots of effort going on in that direction but from an engineering perspective one has to understand that these are two very different goals uh, let's take a look at a practical example from the world i come from uh, you know suppose out what the amounts are what the items are what the addresses are what the billing is and all that stuff right well it turns out that you know uh this can easily be done using deep learning uh you get over 80 85% accuracy but we can actually do it with almost 100% accuracy using logic and perception together plus you also want to deal with things like this where there's handwritten text and deal with things which might not even be an invoice uh at first glance but a human being reading it would immediately know it is an invoice so what you do here is you use perception to actually extract what you can using image uh analysis or image based deep learning or deep learning based image processing and actually populate facts or a database and then you do logic reasoning on that and you get extremely good accuracy we'll turn to this a little bit later but this is an example that logical reasoning from perception is a great ai goal but from an engineering perspective might not be the best way to approach a problem that you need to solve today and somebody that that somebody is going to benefit from it uh the second uh, example i'll take is predicting behavior so this has been the sort of mainstay of uh, of ai and why it's been uh, extremely successful machine learning and deep learning in particular uh we we, we know when we go to any commerce site uh, pretty much uh, uh, what uh, what the site tells us is what we really want uh, uh, except for the small problem we're really targeting which is a, which is an issue but you know the, the today systems are pretty good however it turns out that that fashion items at all who wants to wear a suit on a zoom call right who wants to wear a fashionable clothes when there are no parties uh, and uh, so the entire distribution of what people are buying and who's buying what changed so what what i bought in 2019 has no relationship to what i really want to buy now uh, and it and the question is all that great old data that is kind of useless now so what do we do we have to not only deal with this in ai uh, as a problem but it also brings to fore uh, a very fundamental problem that has been plaguing machine learning and is out of distribution generalization so when the distribution changes you don't generalize well most of the time the distribution didn't change so it was sort of a a non problem but now it's changing every day so tomorrow there's a lockdown it changes tomorrow it goes away it changes again So well, there are ways of looking at this, and uh, the broad technique is called meta learning. And rather than get into any technical details, the basic difference, in my view, between meta learning, machine learning, traditional ways of doing things, and meta learning is a very simple difference. It's a different. So here, I went to its namesake, sort of. This is the ITI. I went to IIT. Uh, of course, many people mistook us from uh, as, as students of the ITI. well the iti teaches people to do a task extremely well and does it really well it teaches them to weld it teaches them to do carpentry etc etc but a university like ashoka doesn't perhaps teach a particular task very well 
but it teaches you how to take the traditional machine learning. You, tra you can train systems to do a very task very well, like you know, predicting what people will buy, but not figuring out that the buying pattern has changed and you should do something different. So there are of course different ways of doing meta learning. I won't go into the, that here, but that is just one big field which has become ever so more important because of the rapid changes in the way data is behaving. For example, uh, you could do meta learning by simply training a system to do many, many tasks, or you could do meta learning by trying to extract logical rules from perception uh, and, and, you, and do that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in this area. I'll now come to decision making, uh, optimization of some sort. I mean, decision making and optimization, managing supply chains is a very important part. And in the past few years, reinforcement learning has been successfully used uh, uh, in the field to optimize supply chains, to optimize inventory, optimize you know uh, logistics and shipping, uh, packing at the lowest level, pre-picking in a distribution center, uh, pre-ordering things like that. Right? Uh, for example, there are cases where uh, where goods are on a route being delivered, uh, ready to be delivered before the order for that particular item has been placed. It's possible because you are able to predict with such uh, uh, accuracy based on past data. Of course, that doesn't work in the current situation. Uh, we had situations where a large uh, retailer would have ordered uh, huge amounts of material uh, from Asia, uh, Asia and, they're, uh, and they're going into the West and the ships are coming and that demand is no longer there. And so what do they have to do? They, have to actually, they can't send the ships back. They have to actually create more warehouse space, convert their stores into warehouses to actually store those goods, and, uh, quickly source uh, supplies from people who uh, perhaps are going out of business. And, and B, uh, uh, they have to come up with new supplies. Now, an AI algorithm trained, and today we don't know how a machine could actually do these. Suppliers go out of business, suppliers repurpose, uh, uh, customers repurpose. For example, auto companies quickly started making ventilators. So what you were shipping to an auto company, suddenly they're requiring different parts. So your entire, again, meta learning is possible in the case of reinforcement learning. Many different ways of doing this. Uh, causality slow and fast learning, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel laureate talked about system one and system two, slow, uh, slow learning to learn the actual distribution over, uh, as it changes and the, to find the change in the distribution, fast learning to optimize for the new distribution. But all that is not possible without data. And this is where very traditional science comes, comes in and uh, uh, you didn't need I hope enough time. I wasn't keeping track. Let's see. I think I'm okay. Uh, five minutes more. Right. Uh, so good old this IT where you are modeling complex systems to build workflow engines comes in very handy to build environments to simulate complex supply chains and enterprises and value chains uh, and use those simulations to train uh, or meta train reinforcement learning algorithms for a variety of different simulated situations, which uh, and people who did that found that their RL algorithms are much more resilient. And people who didn't uh, have these problems. Uh, the last point I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, when you try to deploy an AI system in the real world, let's come back to that sort of invoice processing example. Obviously, you want invoices to be processed automatically. Uh, you don't want to have to check every invoice, otherwise, what's the point of automating something? And let's let me ask. Good question. I mean, an AI algorithm like that for processing invoice that is right 90% of the time versus an algorithm which is sort of right 75% of the time. Well, the first one seems to be better. The tr trouble is you don't know which 10% it's wrong, but the second algorithm, if 50% of the time it could tell you with 99% confidence that it's right, well, then that 50% you could just make sure that you don't, a human doesn't have to check it ever again. But for the balance 50%, you take a, a, a spot check, uh, a quick validation by a human or by another technique. The second algorithm in practice is better, but machine learning literature focuses on the first. And the practical world, this, uh, this dichotomy has not been properly addressed perhaps by the 
uh, by the academic community. And I think this is very, very important. So when we try to write papers, we also also give the calibrations. Well, how often are you and with what coverage can you actually say whether you're right or wrong? Deep learning is notoriously bad at this, but there are ways of fixing that as well. I'll end by saying, uh, well, I'll talk a little plug about TCS research. We, we've been around since 1981. We have well, well over 500 researchers across seven locations in India and a few in the US across a wide variety of areas uh, in computing and uh, the biological and physical sciences advised by some senior people. Uh, and uh, well, we do all kinds of research, AI impacts sort of all of it. Uh, and AI is pretty much just a bunch of useful techniques. And that's a question mark because the expectation was that it tells us something deep about intelligence, the way at the boundaries, perhaps we know a little bit more, more but whether we know anything truly significant, uh, I have my doubts. Of course, in the current candidates, we also did a bit early on, we have candidates with AI. You need to actually get that virus. You need to actually uh, test it in, 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 uh, in vitro, then try it out in animals. All that requires a great collaboration between AI researchers and traditional biologists and others uh, to actually do something useful. Thank you, Dr. Shroff. I invite Dr. Lipika De, Principal Consultant, Tata Consultancy Services, Noida. Hello, everybody. I would like to present our work in the area of natural language processing for gathering business intelligence from unstructured text data. Let me begin with the story. Perhaps all of us remember this incident when a few years back, an angry Sachin Tendulkar had tweeted about the bad services he received from British Airways. British Airways was listening to social media. They did catch the tweet, but they didn't know who Sachin Tendulkar was. And thereafter, there was a lot of anger on the web, which led to a fractured image of the British Airways. So what went wrong? The fact that listening is not enough, but a continuous analysis is required when it comes to social media analytics is something that was not in place. So social media or for that matter, any textual content analytics requires three pillars on which it has to rest one is to listen, the other is to understand who is saying what, when, how, and have an impact assessment of that particular content. The next aspect is to decide how to respond to this particular event, what actions can be taken, and how it can be assessed whether the actions are right or not. So what are the challenges of this particular task? So first of all, as we can see, a word does not mean a unique thing on the web. There are two companies called Cakewalk, one which produces cakes, the other one is producing an, a digital audio software. It has to be understood only from the context. One talks about uh, cakes and pastries while the other one talks about dot wave files and then it has to be understood what exactly is the intent of posting this review what are the issues that are being talked about so when one says that the dot wave file export doesn't seem to work properly it is something to do with the incompatibility of the systems and so on so what we see is not what we actually have to infer and the process of moving from what we are seeing to what is actually required to infer is a challenging task. The challenges become even more because when it is consumer generated text, then uh, we have spelling mistakes, we have non-standard abbreviations, non-standard use of punctuations, and also often switching between various languages within a single piece of content. Our 
important contribution to this field has been to come up with systems which can start right from the ingestion of high volumes of articles to the derivation of actionable operational intelligence. There are a bunch of algorithms that we have published over the years, starting with the one in 2009, which was to address the task of opinion mining from noisy text. So the first step is to correct the noise in a contextual way. As I mentioned that there can be a number of different ways that uh, users are committing errors in writing the piece of information and probabilistic algorithms to correct them have been deployed. The second aspect is to understand what are the key subjects that are being talked about. Again, because grammatical rules cannot be used in these kind of situations, so we have come up with machine learning based information extraction problems which work with high accuracy. The next aspect is also very similar where because the same thing can be talked of in different ways like for example whether I say my pictures are coming out as hazy or I say that the camera is not very good both mean the same thing. So clustering of these concepts are required to understand how much of which aspect is being talked about. The third aspect is contextual interpretation of sentiments. Again, a difficult task because words do not mean the same thing in different contexts. So when I say the price is very high, I want to convey a negative feeling. But when I say the volume is very high, then I want to convey a positive feeling. So again, algorithms for doing appropriate sentiment analysis. Uh, is one of our fundamental contributions to the area. The next aspect is to come up with a complete system to move from the user given text to the business concepts that are important for the people to take actionable steps. So when we say that the cake does not taste good, what we actually mean is there is a need to fundamentally tweak the ingredients and this mapping is not easy, but this mapping has to be done uh, through the intervention of human experts and machine learning and to, to aid uh, this activity is what our system is targeted at. And the last but not the least is to map each of these activities thereafter to be tractable evaluation measures and new KPIs, how one can define them and attach them to the different concepts that are being talked about and to the different actions that are being taken. This is one of the most important aspects of the framework which has been adopted for a diverse kind of service management uh, in diverse sectors. Whether it is for telecom or insurance, the system can be contextualized very easily. Gathering consumer intelligence is one aspect of business analytics. The second aspect is to apply this information in a predictive framework so that once a mistake is made, there is a learning from it and next time it is detected early on or catching the early signals, there should be a way to understand or assess its impact and take timely actions or preempt some calamities from happening. And that is a predictive framework which we have proposed in this particular paper where we talk about how qualitative data like consumer feedbacks, etc. or news can be utilized to first convert them into quantifiable parameters and then use them in a predictive framework 
in this case it's a deep learning based framework to predict the impact on business measurable quantities like revenue customer satisfaction index or even volatility of stock prices and so on so this is one of the most important aspects without which no business analytic system can ever be complete because it is just not enough to react after things have been detected but it is important to react in a proactive fashion and thereby stop major impacts on business so till now i have talked a lot about operational intelligence gathering from uh, unstructured text let me now change tracks and talk a little bit about gathering intelligence which is more strategic in nature this comes not from just internal documents but can come from monitoring issues that are more global which are likely to affect economies industries and so on so what are the sources that we are talking of now are basically can be news from trusted sources they can be authoritative expert analysis company reports technical articles which actually contain a lot of information which are presented in a causal way so here are some examples which are from news articles and reports which cite why the retail sales of automobiles fell in the country in 2018-19 and it was overall slow down in economy it was also lack of credit availability and it was also an erratic monsoon uh if we move further down in 2021 the articles gave a different picture and they started talking about increasing demand due to government rolling out certain uh, manufacturing uh, projects all across the country so therefore the learnings that are there that what kind of policies what kind of uh, issues can be affecting a particular business uh, parameter like growth in sales or demand is very important and it is coming from global knowledge which is embedded in text so our next challenge is how do we extract these kind of information and make sure that we use the right kind of information for business decision making so in this work what we have reported is identification of causal information from text to documents and building causal knowledge graphs automatically the challenges of this work again are many how do we detect causal sentences from a bunch of sentences that are written in the text next how do we identify portions of text as cause or effect or connective uh there is there may not be a single sentence which is always linking causes and effects they may be spread across the text there may be use of pronouns like this has caused a downfall in sales or there could be paraphrases which is saying the same thing in different ways and semantic conceptual similarities have to be established before we can build the graphs so this particular work that we have uh, done is very important because it helps us do all of these things and identify cause effects connectives causal and thereafter build causal graphs from text using deep learning frameworks and this is once again a highly cited work of ours which we are very proud of Causal analytics has multiple uh, applications in the industry. Currently, the kind of applications that we are working on are identification of cause-effect information from root cause analysis reports that might have been prepared by experts in the past. So, learning from that can actually give information about what kind of part failures gave rise to what kind of accidents and thereafter led to what kind of legal cases and penalties and so on. 
very important knowledge bases. Uh, we also do causal analytics from biomedical text where we learn about what kind of drugs are used for what kind of cures or what kind of drugs are causing what kind of adverse effects. Another area that we apply it is for doing sustainability analytics learning from organizational actions, regulatory body actions, and thereafter building causal relations like what kind of illegal transactions led to what kind of violations and penalties, or what kind of positive actions led to awards, and thereafter could be a financial impact on the company's stocks. With that, I would now like to change track once again and come to the current state of affairs. Till now, we have been working with standalone text, which was mostly digital in nature. Right now, what we see is we have a lot of digital documents available, which not only have text, but has a layout structure, has images, infographics, tables, and graphs and charts in it. The beauty of these kind of uh, information repositories is that there is a lot of context that can be additionally used to interpret the text inside it and thereafter do the same kind of tasks that we have been doing earlier that is build ontologies, knowledge graphs and application driven reasoning frameworks on top of it. So this whole area is called multi-structured analytics and is gaining popularity since this additional context can help each other with interpretation of information, something that is a talk of the town for the AI applications. That brings me to the end of the presentation. The global text analytics market is expected to rise by three times in the coming five years with a lot of applications adopting uh, it for fraud management, risk management, cybercrime prevention, and so on. There are a lot of challenges still particularly in terms of the model sizes. They are huge. They themselves need a lot of power to run. So therefore, there is work in building economic models, particularly for industrial applications, which are very domain specific in nature. And there can be a lot of meta knowledge that can be used to build fast yet reliable models. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to present my work to you. I am available at one of these uh, email addresses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Day. We'll start with engineering section five, electrical engineering. I invite Professor Ned Mohan, Regents Professor of the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, USA. Welcome to CUSP. My name is Ned Mohan and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Minnesota. My goal is to briefly describe our educational efforts with CUSP, why and what we are doing, and why this may be of interest to you. As you know, power and energy are the oldest and most mature fields in electrical engineering, but things are changing as we move from old to sustainable. Today, climate change is the gravest threat facing humanity. We need to utilize renewables to generate electricity and use it efficiently. So how do we achieve this? The number one thing we need to do is to provide a first-rate education with an emphasis on sustainability and graduate students in large numbers. Our challenge is that no single university has either the faculty to develop these courses are the critical number of students to take them, including our own university. To overcome this challenge, CUSP has developed all the resources an instructor needs to teach his or her course. These resources have been developed by world-renowned experts from academia and industry who share this vision of providing educational resources with a sustainability focus. This group includes five NAE members and over 10 IEEE fellows. All this content is free of charge 
thanks to the funding from agencies such as the National Science Foundation, the Office of Naval Research, NASA, and the Department of Energy. In this curriculum, we are taking a holistic view of electric power, how it is generated, how it is transmitted, and wherever this power is used. We have implemented this curriculum at the University of Minnesota, and it has been a roaring success. Student enrollment in our senior level courses have more than tripled. Our courses include power systems, power electronics, electric machines and drives, and applications in renewable energy. By clicking on one of the courses, for example, power electronics, you can see the content resources and resources available to download. Uh, these include course learning objectives and other resources. Under course video clips, you will see a list of 30 to 35 videos, one for each lecture. These video clips are 15 to 20 minutes long, covering key concepts. And all these videos are available for you to download. Some of the courses are supported by textbooks, then that can be a great resource. These are available for purchase uh, from the publishers. We have developed labs specifically for these courses. Software labs can be downloaded free of charge. Hardware labs can be purchased through third-party vendors with no financial gain by CUSP. As I have mentioned, all the content is free to download as long as it is used for educational purposes under the terms of use conditions. So you may ask, if all this content is free to download and to use, then why should I become a member of CUSP? Well, membership has its privileges. The first benefit is that you are becoming a part of a community of teaching and learning scholars. Over 350 faculty from 209 U.S. universities have become members of this vibrant community. Secondly, membership affords you access to homework assignments, quizzes, and exams, all things you need to teach your course, which will make your life much easier. To join, you simply need to complete the online form. We are actively disseminating the information about CUSP and soliciting feedback by organizing annual workshops. Moving forward, our plan is to offer a master's degree to practicing engineers by creating a virtual classroom using web-based instructors to teach these courses. Graduate students at other universities may take these courses to supplement their degree plan. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, we at CUSP certainly hope that you will make use of these resources and become a member. Thank you, Professor Mohan. I invite Dr. Ajay Kumar, Secretary, Department of Defense, Government of India. Respected President of the Indian National Academy of Engineers, distinguished panelists and distinguished uh, speakers. It's a privilege for me to share with you some thoughts on what are the challenges and opportunities in developing a defense production ecosystem in India. Defense has traditionally been identified with latest cutting edge technologies frontier uh, technologies which have led the advancement of science and research. However, if we look at India, India remains one of the countries which has largely been dependent on imports and our own defense production and innovation system has not been where it has potential to be. We were till recently seen as the world's largest importers of arms, goods and technologies. If we look at some of the reasons why we have had this dubious distinction, we will see that one of the things that has dominated our defense production ecosystem has been presence of monopoly structures 
which have been largely in the public sector. Even though we have had defense production to the tune of nearly 80,000 crores per year, most of this production is based on licensed technologies and transfer of technologies particularly in defense has led to restrictions with respect to what can be produced, what can be exported, what can be improved and further progressed with. There have been other costs in terms of licensed production. One of those has been that it license in defense particularly comes with a heavy cost as a result what we have traditionally been calling as part of made in India, it comes with a premium. What we make in India traditionally has been 30 to 50 percent higher in cost in terms of the same item if it were to be imported. Like I mentioned earlier, defense technologies have often been on the leading edge of technology and therefore questions are often raised whether India has uh, advanced enough scientific and research ecosystem which could actually produce cutting edge defense items. If we look at some of the other sectors, I think the answer to this question can be seen. We look at our IT industry where we are undoubtedly one of the global leaders both in initially in software services and today increasingly in software products. We look at our startups and we are proud of the startup innovation ecosystem that is today present in India. In fact, this year has been a remarkable year with number of unicorns practically at a rate of one unicorn every week which even the world's most advanced startup ecosystem would be proud of. And each of these startups is been able to raise money from industry, from venture capital and this is validation of the fact that what they are doing is something which is at its best as far as the world is concerned. Let us look at manufacturing. I remember as a child we all aspired to own a Vespa scooter. Bajaj and Vespa had a collaboration under which the Vespa scooters started getting made in India. At some point of time, Bajaj broke away that collaboration with Vespa of Italy and today the Hamara Bajaj is one of the largest scooters producers in the world exporting to scores of countries. If we look at the hero Honda story that is also very similar. Hero which initially had the collaboration with Honda produced high quality Honda motorbikes but thereafter at a point of time they decided to do away with the collaboration and today hero bikes are again all over the world. The point I wanted to make was while these are examples of how the industry started with licensed production but moved on to uh, having progressed and advanced the technology to stages where they were able to compete globally 
and even beat the competition. Why has that not happened in defense? Why is it that in defense we took transfer of technology for T-72 tanks which were produced initially in 72 and 20 years later when T-90 tanks came we again went and took technology for T-90 tanks. Why is it that we could not progress from T-72 tanks and make the tanks ourselves? I think there are lessons which are both in forms of policy as well as in form of regulation. I am reminded of my days in electronics when we were trying to promote electronics innovation in the country. One, one of the companies who have in based in Mysore had world class ventilators, but the regulatory system in our country did not allow them to produce ventilators for India. When COVID came this year and we were seeing those pictures on TV, how many of the developed countries were struggling to cope up with the demand for various medical requirements, hospitals, beds, ventilators. I, it was a scary thought of how we would be able to handle COVID in India with hardly any capability. And it is, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. One of the realization came that we need to change our regulatory mindset. And this ventilator of India, which had not been approved for last nearly several years, this was approved. Many other ventilators and many other medical devices and many other drugs, COVID vaccines, other uh, equipment which were required have been innovated, produced and supplied in the country. And we can all be proud of the fact that today, we, during the last two years of COVID, we did not face the challenge of shortage for any of these. Not only that, we are today exporting these devices, equipment, drugs to over 120 countries. So there is need to have a regulatory mechanism which promotes innovation, our own innovation and enables it to come forward. There is also an element of trust involved in this. I remember and again I will go to the example of how we have learned these <coughs> lessons during COVID. When the vaccines were first made available in the country and approved by the regulatory mechanism, there was a feeling that the India developed vaccine was not good enough and only the foreign produced vaccine would be effective. Without naming anyone, one year down the line, we have all seen how different vaccines across the world have performed. But I am very proud to say the Indian made vaccine has performed as well if not better than many of the global vaccines. I think it is important to we learn to trust and accept our own products. Our Prime Minister often talks about 
by local. I think this is the sentiment of trust and acceptance that he is emphasizing when he talks about being local and buying local. Esteemed friends, defense has, COVID has been a watershed moment for innovation ecosystem in this country. And as I mentioned earlier, defense requires leading edge innovation. In all sectors, in the life cycle of those sectors comes a time when things change and my own experience has shown me that today that time for defense innovation has come. Today more than ever before the government is determined to only use those defense items which are designed, developed and produced in India. What it means for engineers, scientists, technologists is that we should now put all our energies and efforts to be able to produce the best in the world. The time for despondency where the feeling was no matter what we do, the armed forces are going to import is now over. In fact, the policy pronouncements which government has done today are clear indication of this. Government has decided to ban import of large number of items and these will always be produced in India. We have decided to divide our budget into two portions and two third of our budget has been earmarked only for domestic procurement. Another part of this budget has been earmarked only for private industry. And another part of this budget has been earmarked for innovations made by startups. We have taken up several steps to ensure that testing and trial infrastructure, which is so important when it comes to defense, new defense equipment is made available to all players, academics, industry, startups. In fact, the whole ecosystem of research and development is increasingly looking forward to work with all the stakeholders like I mentioned academics, industry, startups and public sector working together for common causes and we have started seeing results. The IDEX program which was particularly focused at startups has shown us that what used to take years, several years is now getting done in months. What used to take hundreds or thousands of crores is now getting done in tens and hundreds of crores. And these startups, which are many of them, which are working in the academic ecosystem of IITs, IIMs or industry are producing technologies which are not only meeting our own requirements in India, but I am so proud to mention that some of these startups have started attracting global research, defense research laboratories to come and work with them. United States Air Force Research Laboratory came up and with our, they're showing their interest to collaborate with two such startups. 
our industry we have started working more and more with our industry under the make one and make two projects we are increasingly enabling our industry to create defense innovation ecosystems defense products defense items for our own defense forces as also for export we are increasingly working with academia in specialized areas new chairs of excellence in defense and nearly 15 to 20 such chairs have been set up in different institutes focusing on niche areas where work needs to be done i could go on and on but i want to mention that i think time has come where we in this country need to increasingly leverage our strengths our strengths in digital technologies our strength in our human resource ecosystem our strength in our startup ecosystem our strengths in our industry our strengths in our academic ecosystem to be able to cater to defense technologies and let me also mention that this effort is not about merely focusing on india's own products it is much more than that from a strategic defense perspective it also has a huge implication because when i am actually importing some technology from a country a and when my adversary is also importing the same technology the advantage which i acquired by importing an expensive technology is neutralized but when i am producing my own technology and my own arms and weaponry the adversary does not know this and this element of surprise the this element of uniqueness is what gives strategic advantage so the determination of the government to use indigenous technologies to use india grown technologies is both for reasons of economic and strategic reasons and therefore and this in this opportunity in this forum let me use this forum to request appeal and encourage all you great engineers leaders academicians that in this sector in the defense sector an area where india has traditionally not been one of the leaders time has come where we can collectively work together we can collectively work together to develop technologies which are the best for indian forces and the best in the world let us all we are free from the government are more than will be more than willing and more than willing to walk uh, more than half the way to meet you and work with you i wish you all the very best thank you jai hind thank you dr kumar i invite professor sekath chakrabarti professor department of electrical engineering indian institute of technology kanpur hello everybody this talk is about uh, development of uh, analytics for smart distribution systems and also about uh, uh, demonstrating those analytics uh, on a living lab kind of uh, platform field platform okay so let me share uh, a few slides all right so before getting into that uh, let's have a quick look at uh, some of the recent developments in smart distribution systems uh, all over the world 
In fact, uh, distribution systems are the most uh, happening place in power systems now. Among the reasons for that, uh, uh, one is the uh, increasing penetration of uh, distributed generators, especially having renewable energy sources. And these renewable energy sources bring tremendous amount of variability with them. So they need to be monitored uh, all the time. And also the consumers are no longer passive entities in the distribution system. They're actively participating in the overall operation of uh, distribution systems in the form of the so-called uh, demand response program, okay? As far as the enablers of these demand response in con is concerned, uh, two things are very critical. One is that uh, we need to have a very high resolution, uh, high time resolution monitoring mechanism. And the other thing is that we have to have controllability over the loads of the consumers. And in order to satisfy these two basic requirements, there has been a rapid increase in the distribution automation and also extensive use of information and communication technology. Everywhere in smart grids and distribution systems, you will see uh, measurement and sensing devices. Okay? That actually enables the development and uh, implementation of a range of analytics for monitoring control and protection of distribution systems. So let's talk a little bit about the smart city field pilot that we have set up in our uh, IIT Kanpur campus. Uh, in the figure, you will see these uh, 12 smart city pilot locations in India. This is our, this is the location of our pilot. By the way, when we talk about uh, smart city, uh, in fact, many things uh, should come into picture, smart uh, distribution system, smart uh, transport, smart building, smart traffic, but uh, given the limitations uh, in funds and uh, scopes, we looked into only the electrical aspects of smart city, okay? And uh, these are uh, some of the highlights of the project. Uh, IIT Kanpur campus is the chosen installation site, it spans around uh, uh, 1000 acres of land. And uh, the uh, smart city prototype is built with the state-of-the-art technologies. Uh, the technologies which uh, at that point was available in India mostly, okay? Because uh, the idea was to uh, develop a prototype uh, smart city model, which uh, would be uh, replicable outside the campus as well in the Indian scenario, okay? The objective was to identify the key challenges in the smart city uh, deployment and development, especially in the Indian context. Because some of the technologies may be available outside, but they may not uh, be available in India and they may not even work in India, okay? And this uh, test setup is working uh, as a uh, research platform, as well as uh, a demonstration and training platform for academicians, as well as industry people uh, all over India, okay? A little bit about uh, the components that are there in this project. There are mainly uh, four uh, key components in this uh, prototype. One is a supervisory control and data acquisition system. Uh, all our substations are uh, under SCADA now. Okay, we have uh, 11 kV underground uh, network and we have RTUs in all the substations. Uh, and uh, SCADA uh, monitors and controls all these substations, okay? That is one major component. Next, we have uh, advanced uh, metering infrastructure, that is AMI, including the smart meter and the associated communication infrastructure. We also have uh, home automation system. This is a very unique feature of this project uh, among the other smart city pilots we actually went inside the houses. We have chosen 20 houses and inside these houses, we have installed home automation devices. The objective was to implement a demand response type of methodologies, okay? The fourth part is uh, the implementation of or integration of uh, rooftop solar PV systems. 
so those smart houses are actually having rooftop solar PV. Okay. So these, and finally, these four components are integrated in the system integration platform using enterprise service bus architecture. This was used in order to make sure that uh, our structure is modular. Okay, uh, because uh, interoperability in distribution system is a big challenge. So we need to develop things in a modular manner so that you know uh, any new vendor come just come in and plug in their devices. Okay. And this uh, platform is working as a training and demonstration uh, facility for utilities, industries, and academic institutes throughout India. So this is electrical system we are dealing with. IIT Kanpur receives power at its 33 by 11 kV substation. Uh, total sanction load at that point was 10.5 MVA. That means if we exceed this amount of load, we have to pay a significant amount of penalty. Okay. The distribution system is underground. Uh, RTUs are installed in substations. As I mentioned, there are 20 houses chosen. In fact, one of them is actually our control center and 19 remaining 19 are residential houses. Along with that, we also have uh, smart meters installed as part of this project into those 20 installations and also a few student hostels. Uh, in, I, and the, I think the present situation is that uh, most of the uh, large buildings are having uh, smart meters installed in our campus. In fact, our AMI is full-fledged in the sense it can accommodate till uh, up to uh, 5,000 5, number of uh, smart meters. So this is the overall uh, system architecture that we have. Uh, SCADA, and then we have uh, solar PVs integrated into the houses. Right, and the one thing you must have noticed that uh, right from the uh, utility end till the end of the consumer, we have to have a very well knit communication infrastructure. Fortunately, in the campus, we had uh, Ethernet, a very well knit Ethernet architecture, and we made uh, full usage of that uh, Ethernet uh, facility. Okay. And this is the overall SCADA architecture that we have. Uh, we, our supplier was an Indian vendor, the Husky was their uh, RTU. And uh, standard protocols are followed everywhere. One thing I'd like to mention here is that uh, just because we are academic, uh, we are an academic institute, uh, we could not afford to do things in ad hoc manner, okay. Uh, everywhere we followed st industry standards. So the idea being this setup should be replicable outside the campus, okay. This is one a snapshot of our control room where we can uh, have different types of uh, you know, visualizations displayed and also you can run your analytics uh, here. This is one single line diagram of the SCADA uh, system that we have. This is the overall single line diagram of our campus. This is overall architecture of the advanced metering in, uh, infrastructure that we have in the campus. Uh, installing AMI and smart meters was a very unique experience. Uh, we had used a number of communication technologies uh, from the smart meter. Uh, the data was communication communicated to the uh, data concentrating units. These are the DCUs uh, through wireless means. And then from there, we made use of the ethernet uh, uh, facility that we uh, have in our campus. Okay. This is the overall scheme of uh, solar integration that we have in those chosen 20 houses. Uh, the integration is done in such a manner that uh, uh, during the daytime, if there is uh, a load in the house, it uh, first satisfies the load in the house. And then if there is anything extra that is uh, that is pumped into the distribution grid. So in that way, if you if the uh, consumer is uh, uh, consuming electricity during the daytime, it actually gives rise to some, some amount of savings in the electricity bill, okay? This is one picture of the solar, typical solar installation that we have in the campus. You can see this solar installation. There are actually another uh, set of panels, uh, 2.5 kilowatt uh, each uh, capacity we have. 
Now, out of these 20 uh, solar PV installations, uh, four were having battery storage as well. And the inverters that we had there, we call them hybrid inverter in the sense they could actually, uh, they could actually work with the, uh, of the grid uh, situations also, uh, also connected to the grid and the battery. And they were fully controllable. And this control was very useful in implementing uh, demand response methodologies, okay? This is uh, one picture of the distribution box that we had used we had to replace the existing distribution boxes. And this is the overall uh, structure of our uh, solar PV integration, okay? So here you can clearly see there are uh, two types of uh, buses here, no non-essential non loads and essential loads. In the demand response, we had included the non-essential loads like heavy loads, uh, air conditioners, uh, geysers, etc. This is a, uh, these are the uh, installation sites in the campus uh, shown on top of a Google map. So some of the analytics in which our students and our researchers are working as of now. Uh, so distribution system state and parameter estimation is one area we are heavily investing on. There are various challenges like unbalanced operation, high RYX ratio. Distribution systems are typically uh, not completely observable. We are taking care of that. Heterogeneous measurements are there. In, this, in fact, this is a very significant problem in distribution systems. We have different types of measurements, mechanisms. Okay, uh, RTUs are there, PMUs, phase measurement units are there, smart meters are there. So how to combine these different types of measurements? Okay, that's not a very easy task. They have different characteristics. They have different refresh rates, even different protocols, and also different timestamps. So these are some of the areas we are investing on. Also uh, finding out the parameters, line parameters in the distribution line. This is also not an easy task because uh, distribution lines are three phase lines unbalanced. So you have to consider three phase lines with the mutual couplings. So the number of parameters to be identified becomes more than the number of measurements. So you might have to take multiple snapshots of measurements, okay? We are working on load modeling, load forecasting as well. Uh, using the historical data that we are storing in our data, you know, uh, in the control center. And we're also applying uh, different big data analysis uh, processes because the amount of data that you are going to handle now because of the, you know, increase in the data refresh rate and the measurement and sensing devices is enormous. So you have to have a big data handling mechanism, right? Distribution reconfiguration methodologies also we are working on uh, we can actually reroute the power by changing the circuit breaker uh, connections. And uh, that actually sometimes uh, give rise to more uh, economy in the overall operation in terms of reduction in the losses, increasing the, increasing the voltage or improving the voltage profile, increasing reliability, et cetera, okay? We're also working on fault detection, isolation, restoration mechanisms using the measurements that we have. Uh, the challenges are that the lines are usually very short, so you have to be very uh, careful with the uh, measurement uh, accuracy. Okay? Demand response mechanisms we are working on, as you mentioned. In fact, that is the reason that uh, why we have this home automation system. And the moment you are handling such a large amount of data, you have to be careful about the uh, security of the data. We are also working on cyber security aspects. We're also working on the uh, improved or enhance interface of the solar PV with the grid. So I, these are some of the activities that we are doing in our campus. Uh, so I think that's all I have as of now. Uh, please, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, my email address is there in the first slide. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Professor Chakrabarti. I now invite Dr. Rahul Tongia, Senior Fellow at the Center for Social and Economic Progress, Adjunct Professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. My name is Rahul Tongia, and it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to be able to share a few thoughts about the future of electricity, a topic dear to my heart, but also something many of us are working on. And I wish to thank the National Academy for giving me this opportunity and this recognition. Now, the electricity grid is 
very, very key to our future as a country and as the world, because we know we need energy for human development. But at the same time, now there is increased pressure to be sustainable. Climate change is, of course, a well known challenge worldwide and developing regions. On the other hand, still need to grow. So while much of the world is saying we need to zero out our emissions for India, that's difficult because our emissions are yet low. We are not a high emitting or polluting country. And so there is still some growth. Now, within India, electricity is the dominant form of energy and its role will only grow more than typical uses that we think of now transportation, other industries. And even if you've heard of green hydrogen, which is going to come from renewable energy as the source to produce the hydrogen will all link to electricity. Unfortunately, the old electricity grid wasn't designed for what we're asking of it. We want this grid to be much greener much more nimble and many other aspects that it wasn't de designed for. The old grid, in fact, the electricity grid in, has been described as the greatest technological achievement of the 20th century. Now we have a vastly complex, highly interconnected thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of nodes system operating in real time altogether. After Samuel Insel's insights, we had economies of scale, which led to what you see on the left hand side, larger power plants, relative centralization at the distribution level, one way flow of power and consumers were involved mainly as payers. They were passive. And in terms of the market and regulation, most places and especially in India, we have cost plus rate of return for most of the utilities. The new grid, on the other hand, is going to have vastly more number of smaller sources of energy. There will be more meshes, more loops, and you will have bi-directional flows of power even at the edge. And consumers will and need to participate not just for when they consume power or of what kind, but they could also be able to become producer consumers, also called prosumers. This will dramatically change how we not just price and regulate the electricity system, but how we control, how we monitor, how we think of safety, how we think of incentives, how we keep uh, the technical constraints of the grid within the limits that, that, that they need. So a smart grid is a loose term that has no one definition, but it's usually spoken about in terms of the functionality we want out of the smart grid. And so we want a system that is more reliable, resilient, efficient, and has more choices, especially greener or cleaner. India has very grand ambitions, especially to limit climate change. In just a few years, we aim to have 250 million smart meters deployed. In terms of renewable energy, from uh, today's base of around 150 gigawatts, 500 gigawatts in less than a decade. If we look at just the solar sector, it's about a seven or eight times growth that people are envisaging. This is unprecedented. <clears throat> now with the grid, if we look at how it was designed and operated in the past, the old need was more supply. India used to suffer from brownouts or load shedding. And of course we want to cut down the losses, both technical and commercial, including theft. That was an old challenge well known, but now we need more energy, but not just energy, but capacity at the right time, right place, right characteristics, and of course, at the right price. So we need to design for more RE. Renewable energy is inherently intermittent. It's both variable and stochastic. Now this is key. It's not just that it varies with predictability, like we know the sun will not be out in the evening or at night, but it can also go up and down. And so these add complexity, local congestion, reverse power flows, etc. In the old system, how you manage the variability of RE was over engineering. So if you are uncertain if the wind will blow, you have something else, usually a fossil fuel, ready in backup to produce or supply power as required. In a smart system, why not we think of modifying demand to meet supply instead of always trying to have supply meet the demand? We also will have electric vehicles growing. Uh, there's a hope that by 2030, a majority of our uh, vehicles sold could be electric, at least of certain classes. Here, 
some past work had shown that it's not an energy problem, kilowatt hours, but really a kilowatt or instantaneous load problem, especially local, dealing at the feeder level, at the transformer level, etc. The last challenge, which we have not yet internalized into our technology designs or planning and training, is security and privacy. A cyber system coupled to a physical gives you huge risks or potentials for failure that we didn't have to worry about in the past. So if we just take meters as one example, <clears throat> we had earlier electromechanical meters, which were relatively inexpensive, but they were not accurate. They couldn't do theft detection. Then we now have mandatorily digital or static meters. And these can communicate if you add communications, but their theft detection could only be at the meter level. So now we have technologies like automated meter reading or AMR, where now you can get a meter read, but the capability is mainly towards historical usage. It is not geared towards real time transmission of data and communications was usually meant to be one way. So you couldn't get control, but with a smart meter or advanced metering infrastructure, also called AMI, we not only gain high net accuracy, but we can get network level theft detection because all the nodes can communicate and we can do either real time or near real time reconciliation of power flows. We would have communications that are bi-directional so that you could have secondary signaling. So in theory, one could send a signal that there is a grid failure or a grid congestion, and therefore one needs to modify load or demand. If we look at AMI, it's useful in so many capabilities that we're just starting to now build out into our design. Everything from outage management, we're starting with detection, automated meter reading, of course, is there. What we could use this for is better load forecasting. This is very key because now our supply is also turning very variable. We could have active load control, theft detection, and of course, for the utility perspective, they could even have prepayment and other functionalities, or at least better auditing and control. But ultimately, what I have found, and it's very key that we have all the stakeholders understand, is that your system design, this is not a component level design. You cannot just design the chip or even a smart meter. It is the ecosystem, including communications, including consumers, appliances, back end, et cetera, that are the intersection of technology, the business case, and the policy slash regulations that we have. Now, Design could be in steps. We will start with easier things, but ultimately there is a belief that we could even have prices to devices. So that way different devices could change their patterns of usage autonomously or with human control or guidance. But which price would you give? Would you give the average price, which is very different than the marginal cost? Think of solar power. Once you've built it, the marginal cost is zero. There's no fuel. Would you have contractual costs or regulated costs? So even something as simple as saying, what is the price of electricity is actually a very complicated issue, which has implications for which type of fuel do you want, where, and how do you control and manage these? Now, the future grid is a big challenge technologically because A, we cannot build this from scratch. We're using our present system. Someone used the analogy that we're trying to change the wheels on a moving vehicle that's going at 500 kilometers an hour with high inertia. Second issue is we cannot look at this in silos. If we tweak something in one side or one aspect, it can have other implications elsewhere. For example, high RE may require dramatic changes in transmission because of the location aspect, especially for wind. We're actually dealing with coupled systems. So do you have them tightly coupled or do you have them loosely coupled? What are your areas of control? What are your areas of optimization? Even visibility itself varies with different designs. A subset of this is where do you put in the intelligence? If I talk of a smart meter, do I put the intelligence in the meter? In the next layer up at the head end system or all the way at the back end, which could be at the cloud? How do you manage trade-offs? You will never get something that is best across all the dimensions. There's not just cost, which everyone worries about, but security, scale, interoperability, et cetera. And here it's important to recognize that standards are useful, 
but there's not just one standard. Just like the internet, we have a portfolio of standards to work with. And the last challenge is high uncertainty. <clears throat> How do we model this? How do we do analysis is an ongoing learning process. We have a problem that most planning today, especially at the policy level, has relied historically on deterministic models. Even load flow analyses have typically done relatively deterministic models, partly because of computational limitations. Luckily, this is changing. So what we do need to do is add in uncertainty across technology, prices, load shape. How will the demand profile look over time? And what are the regulatory regimes? For example, will India have a carbon tax? Just as one example. How do we handle the data? But also, how do we harness the data? Is the data even available? Is it accessible to the right node? And what is the quality of data? Or are we risking garbage in, garbage out? Today, you have a monthly meter read typically for most users. At a five minute resolution, you're talking over 100,000 readings per year per node. And of course, I've already mentioned what are our frameworks for pricing. So my team at CSEP built uh, the first real-time electricity portal called the Carbon Tracker, where we can actually monitor at five minute resolution, all India, what is the electricity by fuel type. And notice that we have this yellow, which is renewable energy maximizing in the middle of the day. In this season in October, the off peak, the evening periods, wind is very low, it's there, Solar is zero overnight. So we find the evening peak, but we have a time of day aspect that is very critical to both system design and pricing and consumption incentives. We, my team at another institute had built out probably the first government utility pilot for smart meters. This was back in 2010, 11 where we put this in a small neighborhood. So in one area of that, an apartment complex, we could see 15 minute meter readings. And notice two things. One is there always will be heterogeneity. So do we want the same control, the same policies, the same frameworks for every consumer, or how do we differentiate? How do we treat the high users differently than the low users? Notice that on different days of the week, we get bursts of consumption at different times. So on a weekday, there's a morning burst, probably cooking or getting ready or water heating, I don't know. And in the evening, we have other bursts. But on a week end, it is only in the midday that we find these bursts. So can we think of smart systems that can incentivize consumers or automatically shift the loads accordingly? We did a large model to look at 2030. This is um, work under publication. Some of it is online on our website where we built a model at high resolution, 30 minutes for all India balancing under a model called economic dispatch. So you choose which type of fuel would operate. A few of the key findings, I won't go into all of them, is one, renewable energy can grow measurably. The government target at that point used to be 450 gigawatts, now it's 500. It is not too much. Even if you have curtailment, it's okay to throw away a little bit of renewable energy because that's still cost effective. The uncertainty in shapes really matter how much RE do you get of what type. And meeting the peak is the key challenge. It's not how do I avoid curtailment or throwing away RE. It's how do I meet that occasional peak, which will have a very low capacity utilization factor, also called plant load factor or PLF. And here, batteries are not a panacea because they're very capital intensive. So if we had a smart system where we could use that to reduce the demand at the peak, that would disproportionately give value instead of having some supply option, be it a battery or natural gas based systems to meet that grid. So grid flexibility and grid balancing and grid control go hand in hand for system design. What else do we need to think about? Grid dispatch operators, uh, the load dispatchers today, they are focused on lowest cost. But how do we incentivize them to choose most efficient, which could be slightly more expensive? How do we handle the power purchase agreements that don't really care about technology or even emissions today? Can our choice of power plants which to operate factor in load pollution, perhaps, oh, sorry, air pollution, perhaps in real time? How do we rethink this grid where we have a rising 
share of renewable energy and thus all our costs will become fixed costs and as renewable energy rises its marginal value declines and yet the cost of integration rises this challenge has not been solved in much of the world and india is very different from other countries so in closing what do we need to do to enable this future grid we need multi stakeholder engagement for system level design we need policymakers regulators technologists communications all the way to chip makers we need to integrate forward looking domains not just networking or internet of things iot ai all of these have to work together to really achieve the potential that's there for efficient and cleaner energy we need more r and d we need for example better batteries storage, better communications, but also technology that is simpler, easier to integrate, easier to manage. So we need capacity building. This is a big gap. This is there for the utilities. This is there for the operators, the planners, but even citizens need to be empowered and made aware of what are their choices and their roles that they can play in this future grid. The future is ultimately about choices and how we have to continuously improve. Back in 2010, I remember a cover of a news magazine with Amitabh Bachchan on the cover with his smart meter. Yes, he had a smart meter as far back as 2010, but that was a niche. Unfortunately, we have to think beyond hype. This is Gartner's hype cycle. I think we've crossed the hype phase and now we're entering this area of enlightenment and productivity. So let us design these systems well. It's an ongoing process. And I close with uh, Amara's law. We tend to overestimate technologies in the short run, but underestimate them in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tongia. Starting with engineering section six, electronics and communication engineering. I invite Professor David Jeffrey Vineland, Philip Knight, Distinguished Research Chair, Department of Physics, University of Oregon, USA. So as you can see, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, using individual atoms as clocks and bits. And the basic idea is not too hard here. We, you know, for, for clocks, we want to, some regular frequency that we can count. So, we, you know, one for some transition, optical transition might be a dipole transition. And, uh, and then we count cycles of the radiation that comes off and then for the the atomic bit is just based on the idea that the atoms, the energy levels are discrete, and so we can store information in different levels. So I'll, I'll say, I'll expand on it in that just a minute. So that I'm going to use atomic ions, charged ion atoms, uh, for examples, and that's mainly because most of the work I've done on this was when I was at NIST, but certainly neutral atoms are very good too. So um, this is, uh, and this, the techniques in, in, in many ways are similar. So, uh, okay, I'll first talk a little bit about atomic clocks. And so why, why do we need precise clocks? And, and for centuries, they've been used in navigation. And actually, if I like this book, it's non-technical, but it sort of gives a history of development of clocks for navigation. Uh, so anyway, that, uh, just to cut to the chase on navigation, so these days, the best navigation system are the ones uh, based on satellites. And the basic idea there is that is that uh, ideally we'd like to have synch synchronized clocks. So the clock on board a satellite is exactly synchronized with your clock on the ground. And then simply the, the, the length, the distance to the satellite is given by the speed of light times the delay time for when the atom was emitted versus when it was uh, absorbed. And to give, it, to give an idea of where things are roughly now, so it, an, an error in timing about, of about 10 to minus nine seconds gives a error in length of about 30 centimeters. And that also roughly corresponds to the frequency stability we need of our of our clock over, say, one day. It's about a part in 10 to the 14. So clocks, uh, you know, our, our ideas aren't any more sophisticated than non-scientists. It's basically we we have some periodic event generator and we just count cycles of that of, of that of that oscillation to generate time. And of course traditional Periodic event generators are first the, the rotation of the Earth, and at least by the mid 17th century, actually, pendulum clocks are very good for, for doing navigation or for, for timing. So, 
it turns out, I mean, you can think of atomic oscillations just like a pinwheel clock. So there's two pictures here we, we can develop. And one is if we have, say, an electric dipole transition, then the, you know, the dipole, the, the charge describing the dipole is oscillating back and forth. And it turns out the oscillation frequency uh, is given by the energy difference between two levels divided by Planck's constant. A simple classical picture suffices for this part of things because, you know, we, it, it doesn't matter that the atom or the electron is smeared out. It still gives us that dipole radiation, which we can detect. And actually, masers and lasers were some of the first accurate clocks. And so the basic idea is you catch the radiation that comes out of the device and then can count cycles of that. And it turns out though it's a little that's a subtle point, but uh, for masers and lasers that you know the atoms being coupled to a cavity, and those two cavities can, or the cavity and the atom can couple together to give get, not give the true atomic shift. So basically, the more common mode of operation that we use is we we first initialize the atoms in the lower state of the clock, and then we apply radiation for a certain amount of time. Uh, near the near the transition frequency, and then basically we, we measure the probability of ex excitation to the separate level. Transition probability is maximum when the frequency of our of our driving source, it could be a laser, is given by the, the the frequency divided by or the energy difference divided by Planck's constant. So when this condition is met, you know, rather than counting radiation cycles from the clock, the atoms themselves, we just count rate, uh, cycles of the radiation source. So why atomic clocks? And it is, you know, there's a number of things to consider, but I'll just cover a couple of examples. So let's compare to the pendulum clock and crystal clocks have similar uh, constraints. But anyway, the, uh, what we have to worry about in the pendulum clock is say changes in temp temperature, uh, and that would cause most, most materials expand when they're heated. So that if the temperature goes up, that would cause the length of to grow and the frequency to slow down, and but even for a very good, uh, 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 you know, a material uh, a very low expansion coefficient, uh, this is this is you know, metals. Most metals are hundred times, hundreds of times larger than this. But anyway, uh, that gives a frequency uh, uh, uncertainty expressed fractionally, or frequency shift expressed fractionally as uh, as about almost a part in ten to the eight per degree C. Now, for atoms, we, I mean, just one picture is we have atoms bouncing around inside of a, uh, a cell that holds them. In fact, the, you know, the early clocks were actually made with, with glass cells. And those were microwave clocks with, and the microwave radi radiation was just propagated through. The temperature sensitivity there is actually a more interesting case. What Einstein told us around the turn of the last century, which was that, you know, it's not, it's, that when when re reference frames move relative to other, in this case, the atoms moving relative to us, uh, they, they they actually time runs slower than them. It's not that they just that somehow their internal properties change. No, it's just that time actually goes slower for a, a moving a, a, a system moving relative to us. And just to give just to give an example for uh, for cesium atoms, the of mass 133, the, the, the frequency shift is about a part in 10 to 15 per degree C. So that's, that's almost seven orders of magnitude smaller than for a mechanical clock. And the other thing is how, how about reproducibility? So uh, the frequency of the pendulum, of course, depends on gravity and the, and the length of the pendulum. And also, for example, the, the, and so manufacturing tolerance has come into play there. And it, uh, it, it also depends on the local value of G. And finally, it depends on where, for example, the bearing may wear a little bit in the, pendulum gets a little bit longer, which causes a shift. So for atoms, what's nice about atoms is all, all atoms of a particular species are essentially identical and they, they don't wear out. We, we, you know, we can keep, if we keep the same atom around, they're going to behave, a, you know, a hundred years later, exactly as we see them behaving now. In any, in any case, the, the first clocks were made on cesium. They were uh, beam clock, atomic beam clocks based on cesium. And uh, in the mid '60s, the uh, was the, the, you know several cesium beam centers have been generated, and uh, so the definition of the internationally agreed on uh, second was uh, uh, decreed to be the so many oscillations of the 
cesium hyperfine transitions given, given by this number. And that that that's still the standard today, although maybe 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 this will change because there's other better clocks now. So what I'm going to be talking about is the atoms or ions in this case that are that are held in one place. And I won't the, the inventors of this device, Hans Tamel and Wolfgang Powell, uh, uh, created this idea. And, and a simple case of the of this of this trap is that on these three electrodes, we apply a combination of oscillating and static uh, electric potentials. And we can arrange those the frequency and the potential such that it creates a three dimensional harmonic well in the center of the trap. So, so a so a crude analog is just a, a two D analog would be like a marble rolling back and forth in a in a bowl. So in at NIST in the this started in the early 1980s. Uh, uh, we we sort of had had looked at mercury as maybe being an optical standard and. Uh, the person in charge of that, that was uh, is pictured here, Jim Berkowitz, his long term colleague for over 40 years and, and had a good friend too. So, anyway, the, the transition we were using, it's got this atomic notation. You don't have to know what that means if you're not clear. But anyway, the, the idea is that, that, that we, we drive from the, the lower electron state to this quadrupole excited uh, D level. And the lifetime of the upper level is about a tenth of a second. And what that means that Nominally, the you know the the range over which the laser is absorbed is 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 roughly one over the the lifetime. We so we want a lifetime to get good discrimination on the frequency. It's a couple of hertz in the case of, of uh, mercury. Uh, so detection. How do we do that? And we actually employ another a second transition in the clock. And this one has the characteristic that when we drive up to from the ground state to the to this P level. The lifetime was only about two nanoseconds, and so we can, we can scatter a lot of light. So that the idea of the detection is then very simple. If we, when we excite or when we try to excite the clock transition, if the atom remains in the ground state, then when we turn on the, this laser here, we, oops, we we will see a lot of scattered. We we'll see a lot of scattered light. On the other hand, if it's been promoted to the to the upper late the upper level of the clock. Uh, when we turn on this, this detection laser, we don't see any scattered light. So it, it turns out in practice, we can get 100% detection efficiency, or at least five nines of detection efficiency. Uh, so uh, there's many things we have to correct for. I, I've already mentioned Einstein's uh, time dilation due to motion. We have more mundane things to worry about, for example, electric and magnetic fields that are always around in the lab. And we have to, we, have to, we can do auxiliary measurements to check what the fields are, and then we can calibrate them out to get the shifts of the of the clock transition. Well, well there's another in interesting effect due to Einstein, and that's what he in his theory of general relativity, he he he, he told us that uh that atoms uh or or actually the op you know atomic systems run slower in a deeper gravitational potential. And so the you know you can see the value from the on the the shift of the Ox on Earth from the Earth's gravitational field at, at sea level. And it's not insignificant to the kind of precisions we're talking about with our clocks. Uh, so, and more, more, more importantly for us clock people is we're interested in comparing clocks. And so we, we have to know the, the shift in those, they may be at different heights with respect to sea level. And that's, that's a, something that has to be figured into our comparisons of the clocks. So anyway, I get just, yeah, just as, it on a more human scale, but it, it's a small shift. And just to give you an idea, how small you know, a little story is: suppose you and a twin sibling were separated at birth. You live at sea level, and your twin lives at, a, at about a mile above uh, sea level. It turns out, after 80 years, your twin will only be at about a millisecond older than you. So it's a very small, uh, you know, effect on our human ordinary day skill. But it's it's something we have to correct for in clocks. But just sort of. We, we do it. We take it serious when we have to crack for this, but just to kind of as a simple demonstration of this of this redshift is that we had this this was that we switched to aluminum later after mercury. It had just it's the ideas are very much the same. It just has some nicer properties that we can exploit. So anyway, this is a, a, the trap for holding the aluminum ions is in this tube here, and what all the clutter you see on the table there is, is optics for guiding laser beams and some electronics and then the lasers are in the background there. So anyway, this was our, our clock based on single aluminum ions. 
And uh, so I'm showing you a picture of one of the labs, and we're going to call this one clock, clock number one, and, and the adjacent lab, back literally just to, to the next room over from this lab. Now we have a, another aluminum clock, which we, you know, we try to make them be the same, and in fact, to within the measurement error, that the ratio of the two frequencies is, is uh, they're exactly the same. And now what what we what we're doing here, so you can see our one of our uh, postdocs at that time. Uh, uh, James Chow, he, he basically raises the first clock by 33 centers, and then we compare the frequencies again. And it's not a it's not a wildly significant effect, but you can see it's statistically significant. We can see this this red shift from just the fact that the atoms are running it faster when they're at, in weaker gravitational potentials. So uh, there's a lot of things I could talk discuss about. Atomic clocks, but one takeaway is just to give you an idea of where we're at as a field. Uh, the, you know, the, the the best performing experiments have a, an uncertainty accounting for all the effects, like you know, uh, you know, the, the second order, or, pardon me, the time dilation shift in magnetic electric fields, and so on. We get down to uncertainties now expressed fractionally, which are around a part in ten to the eighteen. So now I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit and now talk about. Uh, atoms as bits, and these actually the transitions we want here have many of the same characteristics we we want for clocks. We, it turns out we typically use different ions, but the ideas are very basically the same. So, so if we assume the upper level of a, of, a, of our transition has a very long lifetime, then uh, what we can do is we can either put the atom in the ground state or the excited state, and that forms then a bit of information, uh, and so. Uh, and the way we can normally, though, when we drive a, a transition, say part way, what happens is we end up there's a bit of the amplitude in the in the ground state and a bit of the amplitude in the excited state. So we write right a wave function like this. And when we measure this, this is true of any system. When we measure the system, in this case, this this, this quantum bit, uh, we, the, it turns out that this superposition state collapses in either into the zero or one state with probabilities given by these. The, the magnitude of these coefficients squared. So it's, I mean, this whole idea of a superposition is kind of hard to grasp that a, that a bit could be in two states at once, and that's basically what we're saying here. So to, and, and to hammer that point home, we another just demonstration experiment we can do is that our traps, as I said, were like and marbles rolling in a bowl in a harmonic potential. One thing we can do is we uh, we can put the atom in a in a superposition state where at any at some instance of time it's both on the left side of the bowl and on the right side of the bowl. And this you know clearly doesn't make any sense with our ordinary experience, but that's that's kind of the world we live in here. Uh, so now I'll say a little bit about quantum computing. <laughs> Can't really cover very much. I mean certainly you know semester long classes are Taught deedling just with the quantum computing ideas. Anyway, I give you a simple example. So this, let's suppose we have a three-bit register. Uh, so if it was a classical register of bits, we could store one uh, of the eight possible uh, bits formed by this three binary bits. And now, for in the side carrying over this idea of superposition, it turns out we can we can make superposition states which uh, have components from all the possible states. Uh, of the that the, the individual bits are taking, and what's it, what this this is so for three qubits it's eight levels which is 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 two to the three, and and you hit see where I'm headed here. So for a very large number of bits, suppose we had three hundred quantum bits, uh, that would store about uh, you know the number two to the three hundred or two well, the two to three hundred was about digitally about ten to the ninetieth. And this is more than all the, or on the order of all the elementary particles in the universe. So yeah, we clearly can't make a classical memory, which works as well, at least in the superposition sense as we can uh, for this quantum bit. So the other thing to say is that they, there, there's no big mysteries about the gates. They, we do have to, of course, we have to know that they sent, they can work on, on superposition states, but the, I, the basic gates we form are, are very simple. So I'm gonna compare a little bit to the classical to the, Quantum for the for the you know in, in the classical computer the bit flip is a, is a common combination a common operator and in, in a, with our quantum systems we can make something like a two bit AND gate 
And the, the, as I say, the trick is we have to make sure that it works on superposition states as well. The other thing, so what we, so the operations we, I've talked about, uh, uh, you know, some gates here, but we also want to have a third uh, logic operation where we can take any one of the, 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 the states of the of a single bit and transform it to be a superposition. I mean, these coefficients are just a simple way to to, to scale or, or to label the coefficients so, to, so that everything's normalized, et cetera. Uh, so, and we, we often, I'll, I'll later on, I'll change it. I'm going to talk about other kinds of bits where we, uh, where, where we're going to use, use this zero one notation, but in some cases I'm going to be substituting the zero one we've used up to now to be by these up and down arrows. And the reason we chose that is just because of a spin one and a half particle, like an electron, it basically is a two level system, which we can make bits out of. And that it's, it's a difference between whether it's, the electron spin is pointing up or down. So an, another kind of gate we can make is this controlled knot gate. And this, this shows a, uh, the, the truth table basically is just that the second bit flips if the, or pardon me, the second bit stays alone if the first bit is a zero. If the first, if the first bit is a one, then the second bit flips. And this could be done classically too, but the, the, again, the trick is we have to make this work on superposition states. So uh, jumping ahead quite a bit, uh, but anyway, it, it's, it's worth noting uh, Peter Shore, and if you're not familiar with him, Basically, in, in the mid 90s, he came up with an algorithm uh, that said, if you could make this quantum computer, you could efficiently factorize large numbers. And, uh, you know, this maybe sounds a little esoteric, but I think most people in the audience know that the, 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 the commonly used encryption systems derive their security from the inability to factorize large numbers. So anyway, but what we, you know, his, his algorithm is in a very high level crude sense uh, Basically, what we want to do, we'll plug into our register, uh, you know, some uh, a, a number of bits. It could be an equal superposition, say, for this is what it would be for three bits, but we eventually want to go up to hundreds. And so, but it's basically got all the components uh, from zero to up to, to uh, one, one, one in this three bit example. Anyway, but the, 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 the way the computer works then is uh, sorry about that. The way the computer works is, that we apply a series of these cuckoo bits gates that I just described, for example, the controlled knot, and these rotations. And we just apply these, are, this is just a series of operations we apply to our bits. And that with his clever algorithm, Peter Scher's clever, clever algorithm, you can, uh, the way the extraction of the factors go is, is basically that, that, you know, when this is, when it's set up properly, when you, the output state is still gonna, may still be in a number of of, of possible states, <laughs> but if you measure this register, it turns out any one of the, uh, the numbers can be used in a classical algorithm to determine the factors. So I'm just going to again <laughs> go in detail to give you a flavor. So about the time you know his 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 uh, his, his factoring algorithm became known and. Uh, throughout the world in the mid '90s, and anyway, two of our our, our favorite atomic theorists, Ignatius Strack and Peter Zoller from Innsbruck at the time, they came up with a model, the first model for a scaled computer, quantum computer. And uh, you know, it's kind of it, it's real simple. And there's other models too now, but they, but their model was the following: suppose we have a say a five-bit register. So each uh, each cube each qubit here is going to kind of be represented by its is two states and you know, I'm choosing arrows. And the reason I'm choosing arrows is that uh, an ingredient we need for this scheme is we have to consider th this, you know, this five bit array is like a five atom molecule. And we have to consider all the emotional modes of this, of this molecule. And uh, so anyway, we, we want to be able to, for this, all these emotional levels, we'd like to freeze them out in the ground to the ground state. And uh, we do have ways to do that, uh, and, you know, they could be better, but we do have ways to do, we can say laser cool, cool down to the, the ground state of motion. So then the, the basic, the basic way without going into details, the basic way their, 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 their algorithm proceeds is basically, suppose, uh, suppose you wanted to, suppose you wanted to start the, or, or do a, a logic gate between, a spin logic gate between this qubit and this qubit. 
so the first step in there, you know, in their operation is, as you said, you need to cool to the motion ground state. And then what you can do is, you, it, it turns out you can, it, it's fairly simple, <laughs> it takes just too long to describe, but basically you can map the, the superposition, the spin superposition of this, of this qubit onto a superposition of the ground and first excited state of motion for a selected, uh, you know, for selected mode. And the key thing to, to note is that basically when we excite one of these modes, it's the motion is shared amongst, there's a few, there's some modes where it's not, not every ion is excited, but there's enough modes where they all have some movement that uh, the basic idea then is what we, we can do is because this mapping operation, we could do a, uh, you know, if we can do a, a logic gate, a two qubit logic gate between the, 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 the atomic qubit and the qubit formed from these two motional states. And then basically we, through the mapping process, we basically done a, a, a two-bit logic gate between these two lines. And then that final step is we basically just reverse the, the, uh, the, the, the mapping step that we got to mapped into the, to the motion modes. Anyway, what I, all, all I want to say here is, is, is a lot of people work on this. And I did, I'm sure this list isn't up to date, but these are, these are at least the groups uh, up to at least a year or so kind of we're working on aspects of uh, atomic ion quantum comp computation uh, uh, using atoms or uh, nuclear atoms or ions. And so uh, this gives a, a list of people involved. And there, of course, there's many other platforms, uh, you know, a real popular one and, and you know, very good one is uh, uh, qubits based on Joseph's injunctions. And, you you know, you see a lot of news about them in the paper. If you heard the term quantum supremacy, they, they had a demonstration of that one of their papers. Anyway, there's others, there's other, other, uh, you know, other possible physical platforms, but the, the, this is, is the just induction seems to be the most popular one in condensed Anyway, so that, uh, that's about it. But I just first wanted to say is that the, you know, the important part of these parts of this experiment is the, the people working on the thing. So this, you know, we actually started out with two of us in in 1976 that we started working on this thing. And then we got up, this was a couple of years ago, we, you know, we fluctuated from 25 to 30 people. So in this group, uh, there was five regular st uh, staff like myself. And then there, uh, uh, and then there was many students and postdocs and visitors from foreign labs. So anyway, I just want to leave you with that impression that <laughs> it isn't just two guys working in the lab. There's a big army of people and, the, and, and, so maybe some of those groups I showed you aren't as big, but it's worldwide the effort is, involves a lot of people. So I also wanted to say NIST was a great place to be in primarily because there are leaders there. That, uh, my, uh, Catherine Gebby, who was my, my lab leader for most of the time of these experiments were going on, going on uh, uh, she, and with that, I will stop and, and, and thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Jeffrey. I invite Professor Palaghat P. Vedanathan, Professor of Electrical Engineering, California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, CA, USA. Hello, everyone. It is wonderful to have this opportunity to share some of my experiences doing research on signal processing over many years, close to four decades. So I have chosen a few topics, very, very briefly mentioned uh, some of the highlights. Okay, there is not enough time to talk about everything, obviously. All right. So first I will tell you a little bit about filter banks. I worked on this like 30 years ago, possibly. And these filter banks are used widely today for data compression and also in digital communication. Uh, basic idea is to split signals into so-called sub bands like this in the frequency domain and process them independently. So this is, for example, an analysis filter bank that decomposes the signal into sub bands. And the idea is each sub band, for example, if this is speech or music, or an image or a video, the way the human ear or the human eyes 
human visual system perceives depends on frequencies and therefore you take advantage of that perception to compress and quantize them by allocating bits in different subbands for example all right so this is one basic idea in subband coding and filter banks are used widely for that and this is an example of a so called uniform filter bank and they could be non uniform like this and another idea is that when you do this because each uh, band sub band is narrow you could down sample that and that is uh, part of the reason why data compression comes the real reason is that there is compression and quantization going on in the sub bands all right and for example you decompose a signal into two bands you down sample them you quantize them and these are typical filters uh, with two bands here and then you reconstruct them using and uh, this is called an interpolation structure and then you re, uh, de, uh, reconstruct them okay and bit allocation in this subband in these subbands is crucial for this to work and filter banks are also used in digital communications in a different way you first have a synthesis bank and then an analysis bank so multiple signals either multi user or multiple types of messages from the same user they are multiplexed into one signal transmitted over a channel and then you receive them so the channel introduces distortion and there is channel noise how do you design all those filters and how do you choose the sampling rates such that you minimize the distortion to maximize the communication accuracy and efficiency so these are standard problems that many people have worked on of course and those are just some typical communication systems where you will find the use of filter banks so that's a brief introduction to why filter banks are good why filter banks are important and what not some specifics about what i have done okay i have worked on something called perfect reconstruction filter banks many years ago the idea is when you use this for uh, data compression for example there is always a reconstruction error due to compression and quantization that is inevitable but in addition to it there is also reconstruction error due to downsampling that is called the aliasing error and reconstruction error because these filters are never perfect so when the filters decompose and then the filters recombine you never usually get perfect reconstruction unless filters are carefully chosen so we worked on that theory it turns out to be a very non trivial problem i am not going into all the details several groups were working in the early uh, 90s and, and in the late 80s several groups around the world we were also one of those we solved this problem of how to uh, build this uh, design those filters for perfect recovery in absence of quantization and then of course you put back the quantizers and there is effect of compression in particular we came up with something called orthonormal filter banks also called para unitary filter banks they have some especially good properties for example they don't amplify noise and they provide an orthonormal basis for the reconstructed signal in terms of the basis functions created by the synthesis bank impulse responses and we also came up with something called principal component filter banks which uh minimize the reconstruction error under optimal bit allocation so principal component filter banks are ideal filter banks so they need to be approximated in practice and how that approximation can be done optimally we worked on all those things all right and also some applications of these in digital communications okay you will find our a lot of pay i didn't cite any specific paper because there are tons of those papers in the early days you can look them up all right okay here is a typical example of a filter bank that uh, came out of our work this is uh, something where filters are a finite duration in the time domain so they are very easy to implement and so called cosine modulated filters which makes them very efficient in terms of computational uh, complexity and they have the orthogonality property i was briefly mentioning in the previous slide it turns out that uh, my Uh, co-author in this specific work i am showing this slide dr koil pele who is a professor here in india a, a very well known professor here in india he was my student at that time many years ago this was basically his work with me and i will also touch on another area called co-prime sampling or more generally sparse arrays 
for signal processing. So going back again, any signal that we digitize, meaning put on the computer, we always sample the signal first. And usually there are some theoretical minimum sampling rates that we have to respect called the Nyquist rate. It turns out that under some conditions, we can violate the Nyquist rate and still be able to achieve what we want. Compressive sensing is of course one way to do it. And here, this is very different called coprime sampling. What it is, is that you downsample the signal by a factor of M and a factor of N. So there are two sets of samples, okay? And it is possible from these downsampled versions to reconstruct a dense version of the order correlation of the signal as long as the integers m and n are co-prime. That means they have no common factors other than unity. Okay, we have shown this. And therefore, any application that depends only on autocorrelations, there are tons of such applications that signal processing experts would know. Any such application would benefit from this. And this m and n can be as large as you please. Therefore, the downsampling can be as much as you please. Only thing is there should be enough samples to do the averaging and compute the autocorrelations. All right. So this was uh, much more recent compared to the filter bank work. So I am just sampling everything by a sample spacing of 10 years. So showing you a few things here. Okay. And the application of one of the applications is in array processing. You have N sensors in space, so-called uniform linear array that people have been using for many, many decades in array processing, radar, for example. These are useful to identify the directions of signals arriving at various angles. And it's well known that with the with n sensors, at most n minus one source directions can be identified based on second order statistical information. Higher order statistics, different story. And th those are just names of standard algorithms that existed for many, many years to do this, okay? We introduce sparse arrays. Well, sparse arrays have been known. We introduce specific types of sparse arrays called the nested array, co-prime array, super nested array, and whatnot. For example, here is an example of a nested array where there's a dense part and a sparse part. So the array has larger aperture and therefore better resolution. But more importantly, it has a so-called difference set. That's a difference set of those locations, which is a uniform linear array. And it's very dense, it has order of n square elements where n is the number of sensors. Because of that, it is possible to identify order of n square source directions instead of just n minus one source directions. This is a big deal because with relatively fewer sensors, few sensors, you can identify many more source directions. And this is really true with nested arrays, co-prime arrays, and there were historically another class of arrays called minimum redundancy arrays. But nested and co-prime arrays have a very nice geometry, which makes it very appealing to implement. And this different set is also called the co-array or the synthetic aperture, which is produced by these arrays, okay? So again, papers, uh, 2010, uh, for almost 10 years, we have uh, done some of these things, okay? Just another example called co-prime arrays, again, the Physical array is a union of those two, and the co-array is a dense array, which really performs the magic, okay? All right. And here is just an example. This plot, every sharp line is a source direction. Theta is the direction, okay? Main point is that the number of peaks, which is the number of sources, is way more than the total number of sensors, which is 12, I believe, in this case. It is definitely less than 20. That's the most important thing here, okay? All right. Uh, so again, those are the those are the others. Professor Paul, again, she's a professor today, and she was a student with me at, at the time that we did this work. And uh, two-dimensional extensions, okay, of this are also there. Another student of mine, Professor Liu, he's a professor today uh, in Taiwan. He was uh, with me doing extensions in many directions, including multiple dimensions. And this is one of my laddus. I love to talk about this for another few minutes, maybe four or five minutes. Connection between uh, the famous Srinivasa Ramarajan's work and signal processing. Uh, we got into this because one of my very good friends in India sent me some papers by another very good friend in India. 
and that uh, triggered uh, this uh, idea of connecting Ramarujan to signal processing. Okay, all right. So identifying periodic patterns in signals has been there for a long time, and there is any number of applications. I don't have to be a salesman to tell you what those applications are. They are all very well known. But Fourier methods to identify periods sometimes work, sometimes don't work, especially short segments of data doesn't work very well. Periods that change with time frequently, so that one period is so narrowly localized, it's very hard to find. Those situations are much more challenging. Also, multiple hidden periods in the same signal, multi-pitch estimation, even though there exist techniques all over the place, especially in speech literature, audio literature, they don't necessarily always work very well, especially if the segment of data is very short. We uh, ran into this Ramanujan sum because of the paper uh, sent by my friend. And when I looked at this, that triggered this idea. Wow, this looks like it's a periodic signal and it can be used as a basis to identify periodic patterns. That's because these signals happen to have beautiful integer values, which is useful to some extent. But more interestingly, there are many other applications, many other properties that we discovered. Ramarjan himself had found a number of properties which will be which were very appealing to number theorists. But from a single processing viewpoint, we found that there are some other very nice properties. So we are very honored to make this connection to Ramarjan. Now, one of the things we found was we came up with the idea of Ramarjan subspaces, which are obtained by starting from Ramarjan sums and producing a finite number of shifted versions. They span a subspace of a certain dimension and they have periodicity properties. And the basis of those subspace, the basis vectors are integers, which is very convenient. And I introduced this uh, a few years ago, uh, eight, seven to eight years ago, and you can find it in the IEEE journals. And one theorem we came up with was that any length and signal, not necessarily periodic signal, can always be decomposed as a linear combination of this Ramanujan uh, space, Ramarajan subspace signals, XQI. Okay. And the main thing is this is an orthogonal decomposition. So the Ramarajan subspaces have periodic signals, but the important point is that the set of all periodic signals with a given period does not form a subspace. On the other hand, the Ramarajan subspace is a subspace and it does have periodic signals with a specific period. So they can be combined to uh, represent arbitrary periodic signals, which may be buried in arbitrary signals. Okay, so we went through that and here's an example. Here is a signal with those hidden periods. Traditional Fourier analysis does not reveal those hidden periods. The Ramarjan method comes up finally with a plot called the strength versus period plot. You can see the period specifically here. That's the main thing, all right? And even when periods are time varying. So here is a signal when the period is localized here, localized here and so forth. And these are all very short segments of localization. We have the so-called Ramanujan filter bands, which produce a time period plot, time period plane plot, from where the localized periods, period five here, period seven, 11, 14 here, well, seven and four, period 14 and 11 here, because seven is uh, submultiple, therefore seven RSS naturally. So we can identify all those things wonderfully, okay? So we were very happy to make this connection to Ramarjan's work. That's where you can find this specific paper, okay? And here are some references uh, as a starting point. We have many more papers in this direction. If you are interested, you can look up all those things. And I won't talk about our other areas of interest. There are there's too many there, okay? Thank you very much again and namaste. Thank you, Professor Vedanathan. I invite Professor Yogesh Singh Chauhan, Professor, Department of Electrical Engineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. Hello, everyone. I am Yogesh Singh Chauhan, Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Kanpur. Today, I am going to talk about characterization and modeling of transistors for circuit design. Here is the motivation. On the left side, we are seeing a 5 megabyte hard drive, which has huge size shipped by IBM in 1956. Now you see we are carrying 
hundreds of gigabyte of these memories in our pocket and semiconductors have played a big role in reducing the size and improving the performance in every aspect of life semiconductors are playing an integral role in the global economy several hundreds of billion dollar market is already there and you can see for the forecast in 2025 we will be having uh, communications computing driving this market along with the consumer electronics automotive and also industrial and government market artificial intelligence and machine learning are powerful industry growth drivers nowadays for these semiconductors what is a semiconductor you can see there is a this is the energy band diagram where we see if it is a metal the bands are overlapping and if it's a semiconductor there is a gap there which is called band gap between the two bands and this is what actually is used and you can play with it uh, so that you can use it for variety of applications and on the bottom you are seeing a semiconductor wafer where we are seeing several chips are being manufactured in a particular wafer the building block of the chips it's tiny mosfet it's a transistor used for either amplification or switching of electronic signals so that is either for analog or rf applications or for digital applications here gate controls the flow of electrons or holes from source to drain and this is the property which is used in designing circuits once we have a transistor we use it to design large scale circuits all the way from you see not gate to flip flops to adders and memories all these are used then for designing a bigger and bigger circuit for making these chips we have to first do the design on computer this is called vlsi chip design very large scale integration chip design and here the process targeted design element uh, in enablement which is the pdk plays an important role and inside this pdk is we have device models or compact models which are used for circuit simulation along with other components shown here in the design automation block this is on the from the special usu on 40th anniversary of spice here spice is a circuit engine which actually simulates the circuit and father of spice said it was the device model not the algorithms which played an important or key role to the success of circuit simulation program so what is a compact model it's a medium of information exchange from the foundry or fab to circuit designers a good model should be accurate and simple and this accuracy and simplicity uh, balance between this depends on end application and a compact model must have excellent convergence it should have a very low simulation time and the accuracy requirements are very high like 1% rms error after fitting the ivc v curve some examples are asm hemp model bsim bulk model bsim cmg model so how is the compact model complexity here shown is for example a simple model is i equal to v by r coming from ohm's law so this is a compact model but if you talk about adding the real effects then we have to add here the temperature scaling because resistance varies with temperature and then we also have to add the geometrical scaling further we have to add the self heating effect and then you can see that with all this the model becomes more and more complex an industry standard model for resistor will be thousands of lines of code in written in a particular language so there are a lot of challenges in spice models all the way we have to take care of material properties physics of the device uh, mathematical aspects and the simulation aspect and also the end application aspect like 
uh, whether it's for analog, digital or RF circuit simulation. So we have been working on this compact model in my group. We call it art based on science. We modularize this development where we have one what is called a core model and then we add all the effects on top of this one by one to increase the complexity but accuracy so that it actually mimics the real device. Uh, we are working on BSIM family of compact models. Uh, these are industry standard models and we actually support here from IIT Kanpur these models and these are widely used in the semiconductor industry. We are also working on BSIM HV high voltage MOSFET model. This is also industry standard model used for LD MOS, VD MOS transistors, uh, especially for like automotive applications, etc. We are also working on uh, 2D transistors, uh, which have several interesting aspects, and these are again very. Uh, 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 this is also futuristic and emerging transistor which might be used in lot of different applications and here you are seeing our model validation with the measurement data. We are also working on 3.5 transistors. Uh, these have uh, uh, high mobility which again gives rise to high performance. So these are also uh, being explored for future applications and we have developed models for these. We are also working on nanowire transistors, nano sheet transistors, which might be coming in the production uh, very soon in like 2024 or so. And we are working on modeling of several aspects of these transistors like quasi ballistic transport, density of state effect. We are also working on insulator metal transition phase fat modeling. Uh, this again transistor has very interesting property because it can change the uh, resistance all the way from insulator to metal as the temperature is varied. So we have worked on the modeling of this and uh, this paper was published in IEEE TED. We are also working on another very promising device which is called negative capacitance transistor. Uh, we are working on several aspects of this transistor. Uh, this has promise of reducing the uh, power by uh, here you can see we can reduce the VDD by half but can get same current. So uh, we are working on uh, modeling of these transistors. We are also working on circuit design aspects. So you can see the inverter property and also the memory uh, uh, using these transistors. Uh, this is the book which we have written on the BSIM CMG which is industry standard model for FinFET uh, which actually has lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, here everything whatever is there in the BSIM CMG is actually captured in this book. Uh, this is the book which we have written on the industry standard model for FDSY transistors BSIM IMG model and again in this book we have everything whatever is there in the BSIM IMG model has been explained. Uh, just to uh, tell you that there is an industry standardization body which actually standardizes these compact models and we work very closely with this uh, industry standard body called CMC and almost all the major semiconductor companies and research consortia foundries are members of this CMC. So this is the list of uh, industry standard models and all the blue color here shown devices uh, we are actually developing models for these devices and also supporting them. Uh, here we are showing you a news from 2018 where our industry, our ASM hemp model became industry standard and it is one of the two models in the world which is which are industry standard. And here you see on the right bottom is the website which is there for downloading this model. And this model is already available in almost all the commercial EDA tools. This was the media coverage which was there uh, once this uh, model became industry standard. We are also working on this uh, other aspects of this model. So uh, this is here shown how the ASM hemp model is used for designing the gallium nitride based chips. And uh, on the left side bottom here is shown the schematic of where the ASM hemp is fitting in the, uh, the uh, in the PDK and right bottom is shown the large signal model validation with the measurement data. 
we are also working on rf circuit design on the top we are showing the recently we have worked on the low noise power amplifier using gallium arsenide and here is the fabrication uh, you can see the chip being shown here and also the measurement uh, result on the right uh, top uh, uh, you can see the how the noise circles are there shown for two different frequencies we are also working on power amplifier using gallium nitride uh, based transistors and my group is very active in these uh, designs uh, this is my group here at iit kanpur uh, we have you can see a large number of phd's and postdoc 13 phd students have graduated we work very closely with the industry almost all the semiconductor companies we work with we are regularly publishing in journals and conferences and you can also see the characterization lab which we have here uh, which is state of the art device characterization laboratory in india thank you thank you professor chauhan i invite professor saurabh lodha professor department of electrical engineering iit bombay hello everyone i am saurabh lodha from the department of electrical engineering at iit bombay and i would like to thank ine for inviting me to deliver this talk on emerging electronic and optoelectronic materials and devices uh to give you a bit of my background uh, i did my phd from purdue university in the us and then worked at intel corporation on advanced silicon cmos technologies i joined iit bombay as a faculty in 2010 where i am currently a professor in the electrical engineering department and continuing my work from intel i have been looking at advanced cmos using germanium channels and also 2d materials for future low power devices including transistors and photo detectors uh my research group at iit bombay since 2010 uh has uh worked with closely with industry uh it has currently about 6 phd students and two postdocs and masters and uh we have collaborations not only in india but also abroad with universities such as ohio state university denmark technical university monash university tu delft and tu eindhoven and a lot of my research projects have been funded by both the industry and the government uh, ministry of electronics and information technology and the department science and department of science and technology government of india besides applied materials and synopsis so um if you look at my research trajectory over the last 10 years at iit bombay i started off looking at advanced cmos for high performance transistors specifically looking at germanium transistors uh, we built transistors here at iit bombay all the way from a bare substrate to a fully integrated transistor uh looking at various aspects involved uh with the transistor performance that i'll talk about later and we work very closely with applied materials and synopsis on various aspects of germanium cmos uh more recently we have been looking at germanium tin as a channel material for advanced cmos transistors uh around 2013 we also started looking at ultra thin semiconductors such as mos2 uh and its uh Uh, and similar other similar semiconductors for low power devices uh, because of their ultra thin nature uh, here we looked at transistors uh, we looked at diodes and more recently we have also been looking at uh, opto electronic devices such as photo detectors uh, as shown here and last but not the least uh, very recently we have started working on the wide band gap semiconductor gallium oxide for power electronic applications So in this talk, um, uh, you I will basically uh, focus on the work we've done on germanium CMOS as well as two uh, D material based devices, where we have focused both on research as well as technology development. So if you look at the motivation for this work, it comes from transistor scaling, uh, and right from nineteen seventy four, the silicon transistors has seen a lot of innovations, starting from dimensional scaling, uh, going through strain engineering. then the high k metal gate gate stack and then more recently since 2012 all of our uh, laptop microprocessors and mobile phone processors have been powered with this finfin device and we are currently at the 5 nanometer node and the question is what comes after this so there are two trajectories here one is the high performance trajectory where you have high mobility materials such as germanium and 35 materials that can replace silicon and give you more 
uh, higher current for the same voltage. Uh, and on the other hand, you have low power uh, consumption transistors such as the negative capacitance transistor, you have the gate collar arm transistor, the tunnel fed, uh, and more recently, these devices based on ultra thin semiconductors such as MOS2. And to, to think about it, the low power transistors can actually reduce uh, power consumption and give you longer battery life in your, in your laptops and your mobile phones. So our focus has been on both these uh, uh, trajectories, one on germanium for advanced, uh, for, for high performance and on 2D materials based transistors for low power consumption. So let me start off with our germanium uh, MOSFET uh, based research. If you look at the germanium transistor, here is a TEM picture of a germanium transistor. There are several challenges in making this uh, work uh, at, for high performance. One is the gate stack. The second is the contacts to the safe source and drain, and the third are the third is the junction with uh, between the source between the drain and the bulk. And here we have worked on all three aspects. For example, for gate stacks, uh, we have shown ultra scaled gate stacks on germanium, which are thermally stable. Uh, you can tune the VT of this gate stack for both N-type and P-type transistors, and you have very reliable performance. Uh, for the contacts, we have worked on solutions to unpin the Fermi level on germanium and demonstrated low resistance contacts, which are also thermally stable. And with respect to the junctions, we have worked on enhancing the dopant activation uh, in these junctions, including on FinFETs, uh, and uh, demonstrating low leakage uh, for this uh, uh, PN junctions. And as you can see, these are essentially transistor process module solutions that we have worked on. And I'll go through these in a little bit of detail. Uh, let's look at low resistance contacts to germanium. Uh, in our very first work, we showed that we can insert a thin zinc oxide layer. Here it's three nanometers thick between a metal and intact germanium that helps to unpin its Fermi level and reduce the contact resistance. Later, we showed that it's not just zinc oxide, but even aluminum doped zinc oxide and ITO uh, that can be used as these interlayers between metal and germanium to get a Fermi level unpinning and low resistance contacts. Later, we showed that dioxide also works. And if you uh, couple it with a low work function metal such as deuterium, then you can reach ultra low resistivities. In this case, we demonstrated about 10 to minus 8 ohm centimeter square on N-type germanium, which at that time was the lowest uh, contact resistivity demonstrated on germanium. And then we uh, also showed uh, more recently that if you nitridize this dioxide, then you can uh, have very stable, thermally stable contacts all the way up to 400 degrees Celsius. So the resistance does not change even if you heat the contacts up to 400 degrees Celsius. Moving on to gate stacks and germanium channels, the first thing to study gate stacks that we did was to develop a process flow that uh, incorporates a full gate stack and source strain junctions into this transistor at IIT Bombay. And then we worked very closely on the gate stacks with applied materials to show that using one of their 300 millimeter tools, if you nitridize the interlayer between germanium and, uh, and the gate, uh, using their plasma nitrodation tool, then you can actually get fairly high mobilities, much better than when you use a rapid thermal process. And this was featured in their technology journal here uh, that you can see. And later we also worked on the high key aspect of the gate stack where we showed that instead of using just hafnium oxide, if you alloy it with aluminum, then the hafnium aluminum oxide high K dielectric is much more thermally stable on germanium as compared to HFO2. This was a work that we did very closely with applied materials. Uh, and then uh, continuing on to the source strain junctions in germanium, here also we worked very closely with applied materials. And we showed that for both N-type implants using phosphorus or P-type implants uh, using boron, if you implant the species at cryogenic temperatures, which is minus 100 degrees Celsius here, and here you can get much higher dopant activation as well as a shallower junction. And we showed this for both phosphorus and boron. And we also showed that if it was a fin set, then you need to go to higher temperatures uh, to get bet better dopant activation and crystallization of the germanium fin. 
it was not just the dopant activation that improved uh, the leakage, uh, which means the defects uh, at the junction boundary also went down for the uh, for the PN junction. And uh, in fact, for the boron doped uh, PN junction, we got fairly low contact resistivities here uh, in this work. Um, this cryogenic implantation uh, is now a part of applied materials 300 millimeter uh, tool that they sell for advanced semiconductor nodes. As you can see, this clearly advertises the cryogenic implant uh, work uh, for advanced node processing. And the, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the work that we did on germanium gate stacks uh, is, was part of applied materials technology journal here that they sent to all their customers. So this is the work that we've done on germanium CMOS. Uh, moving on, uh, we started around 2013 to work on 2D materials. Um, everyone knows that graphene was discovered in 2004 for which Gaim and Novoselev got the Nobel Prize. And since then there have been a plethora of 2D materials uh, that uh, scientists and engineers have been using um, all over the world promising various applications in electronics, spintronics, sensing, and so on. In fact, the world's uh, smallest transistor has been demonstrated using a 2D material MOS2. Here you can see this cartoon, which shows a one nanometer gate uh, for this MOS2 transistor. So our focus has been on transistors, electronic uh, devices, and optoelectronic devices in terms of photo detectors. So we've been broadly working in three areas, which is, as I said, electronic devices, uh, uh, and then in device modeling, looking at EFT simulations for some of these 2D material interfaces, and uh, also an, in, on photo detection using um, heterostructures and other techniques. Uh, in terms of the electronic devices, we've looked at hysteresis in, in a device, uh, in, in transistors based on MOS2, We've looked at suspended transistors and one by F noise in these suspended transistors. We have looked at PN junctions in MOS2. Uh, and more recently, we've looked at transistors based on WSC2, where we've demonstrated all four modes of transport, P-type, N-type, ambipolar, and antipolar. I'll talk about these in a little more detail later. Uh, in terms of the DFT simulations, we look at interfaces like the dioxide MOS2 interface here. Uh, we've also looked at uh, developing transport simulations to look at RF performance of 2D material based transistors. And more recently, uh, we have started looking at uh, photo detectors uh, and plasmonics in 2D materials, looking at heterostructures, uh, suspended photo detectors, and so on. So, let me show you some of the work that we've done with respect to the transistors and electronic transport in 2D materials. When we started off, with the first thing we did was to demonstrate Fermi level pinning in MOS2. As you can see here, this is a, a single layer MOS2, 1.7 nanometer thick film uh, with contacts on top of it. Uh, this is a backgated transistor. And we showed that no matter what metal you put on MOS2, you get Fermi level pinning close to its conduction band. And then we showed that if you insert a very thin dioxide layer between the metal and the MOS2, and you can unpin uh, uh, its Fermi level and get much lower contact resistance. Um, later on, we moved on to show that we can dope MOS2 P-type. Uh, intrinsically, MOS2 is N-type, and so it gives you these N-type transistor curves, and you can make it P-type if you dope it with phosphorus using a plasma. And we demonstrated very uh, good performance for PN junction diodes uh, made in MOS2. As you can see here, the rectification ratio reaching 10 raised to 4. Um, and then we also worked with uh, Denmark Technical University on this project where we showed that in MOS2, you have this reversible uh, hysteresis inversion, which basically means that you have clockwise hysteresis at uh, low temperatures that become anti-clockwise at higher temperatures. And then you can go back and forth uh, with temperature sweeps uh, between these two kinds of hysteresis. And this can be used for memory devices. So this is work that we did with uh, collaborators in Denmark. More recently, in terms of electronic transport into the materials, uh, we have just published a paper uh, in ACS Nano where we show that you can uh, have a material like WSC2 with multiple gates at the bottom, and you can make it work as a P-type transistor, make it work as an N-type transistor, make it work in an anti-ambipolar uh, 
this blue curve, uh, anti-ambipolar mode, or an ambipolar mode, which is in this pink curve. And it's not just about making it work in these different modes. You can use this then to actually transmit data uh, uh, using uh, phase frequency or amplitude modulation. And you can see here, uh, uh, what, you know, data transmission uh, for a two bit, uh, for two bit data, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, uh, using this device. Moving on from uh, transistors and electronic transport, we've also looked at optoelectronic devices based on 2D materials, specifically photo detectors. And here, when we started off, we looked at this fundamental problem in uh, 2D materials based photo detectors where uh, you basically trade off responsivity versus speed. So responsivity is the amount of photo current you can get from the photo detector and response time corresponds to the speed uh, of the photo detector. And we showed that in these RES to photo detectors, you can get fast speed, but low responsivity, and you can get high responsivity, but slower speed. And then we showed that you can overcome a part of this trade-off by using heterostructures such as RES2 and WSE2 here forming a PN junction where we use the internal electric field to sweep out the carriers and you can get much higher uh, photo responsivity, uh, a combination of high photo responsivity and high speed simultaneously. More recently this year, we published a paper where we showed that if you integrate a lateral PN junction with a WSE2 uh, transistor photo detector, then you can actually get all three metrics uh, high simultaneously, which is the detectivity, the speed, and the responsivity. So here you get a responsivity close to about 100 amps per watt, a speed which is close to a microsecond, and a detectivity as high as 10 to 13 joules. So uh, you can use these kind of engineering techniques to enhance the performance of 2D materials based photo detectors. To uh, summarize my presentation and give you an outlook of where we are headed in terms of our research, what I've shown you so far is our work on high performance devices based on Germanium, uh, where I showed you uh, transistors that were fabricated entirely at ID Bombay using ultra thin uh, gate stacks. Um, and then I also showed you uh, some of our work on low power uh, transistors and photo detectors using these ultra thin semiconductors such as MOS2. Uh, and leveraging our expertise on germanium seawalls, we have now started working on transistors uh, based on beta gallium oxide, which is an emerging semiconductor, a wide band gap semiconductor holding a lot of promise for power electronics, so high power applications. And this work we are doing in collaboration with Ohio State University. And uh, the expertise that we've developed on 2D materials, uh, we are now extending it towards looking at devices such as the one that I've shown here uh, that can be used for neuromorphic computing, meaning computing, which is like the human brain. And this device, for example, here works like a neuron uh, in, our, in our brain. So this is some of the work that we have been uh, doing now in our research group. And with that, I would like to end my talk and I thank you for your attention and I'll questions from the audience in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Saurabh. I invite Mr. Raghavan Murli Dharan, Chief Technology Officer, Tata Advanced Systems Limited, Mumbai. I am R. Murli Dharan, CTO at Tata Advanced Systems, Mumbai. I thank INAE for giving me an opportunity to present my work titled Engineering Strategic Systems. Today's short presentation is on engineering strategic systems for the India's Atmanar uh, In today's presentation, I'll share some experiences in developing strategic systems. Let me define what strategic systems are. They are mission critical real time systems architected using the right mix of hardware and software. Right? If you look at the strategic systems worldwide, otherwise called as the military expenditure worldwide, uh, military systems are a monopsony in India and rest of the world. And globally, the world has been spending close to $2,000 billion in the military systems. In 2020, the CIPRI reports is $1981 billion, right? which is 2.4% of the global GDP. 
and it amounts to $250 per person. Right? So the five largest spenders are US, China, India, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Right? And five of these countries together spent nearly 62% of the total military expenditure. Right? India spends close to 72 million. Right? And we are the second largest importer of arms in the world and this gives us an opportunity to create a lot of weapon systems in India. Right? Uh, now just to uh, get a back, uh, start, right? India knew the Pythagoras theorem long before Pythagoras invented it. Right? So we have a large legacy of knowing a lot of things but we lost it in between. Now we need to regain it to come up with the latest systems in the world. Right? So credits disclaimers, thanks to Tata Advanced Systems for letting me do this and it is all my personal views and not the companies or their modis and most of the data, I'm, all the data I am sharing is unclassified data. Right? So in a strategic system, okay, the most important thing is all the systems are software defined, they are software defined systems. Mission critical systems are real time systems architected with the right mix of hardware and software. Okay? They have embedded software, they have change, the changes are made through software, they are, there are time sensitive functionality in hardware, there are programmable hardware elements within the system. Right? Examples are software driven radio, software driven networking, software driven radar and things like that. And you might recollect that Tannenbaum in his classic book on computers stated that both software and hardware are logically equivalent and that allows us to change the mix based on the final requirement. Right? So when you engineer a system, right, you want to develop a strategic system or a weapon system, right? So how do we engineer them, system engineer them correctly? Right? Earlier we, we used to make a physical prototype, test it out, improvise as we go ahead making multiples of pro, uh, physical prototypes and it used to take a long time. Okay? Newer tools have helped us develop a digital twin. Okay? So you system engineer and put it in a digital twin, so digital twin will give you a digital prototype right? which will help you validate most of your, all, all or most of your assumptions etc. Right? So in Tassel, we develop a large number of products, especially the division on uh, dealing with C4I, weapon systems and sensors. We have lots of things on artillery, we have c cube die systems or C4I systems, optronics, radars, launchers and what not, fuel cells, etc. Right? So one of the recent things that we have been developing is a fuel cell. Right? A fuel cell is very important from the aspect that you need, you need to have a stealth way of generating power rather than a diesel generator. A diesel generator generates noise and also thermal signatures okay? and it needs a fuel to be, uh, standard fuel to be used in it, a diesel. Right? So rather than that, can we have a quiet, no thermal signature kind of power source and that is the fuel cell system using compressed hydrogen. Right? We are developing this technology which in future most of the mobile power systems will be generating fuel from a fuel cell, power from a fuel cell okay, using hydrogen rather than using a noisy diesel generator. Okay. Now let us look at what are the challenges in developing a strategic system. Right? The first challenge is the life cycle of a strategic system or a weapon system is of the order of 20 to 30 years. Right? And hence the system that you develop today has to work for another 30 years and hence the components used, subsystems used, technology used, etc. should be such that it can be sustained for 30 years. Second, the requirements and uh, change quite a lot. In 30 years, you know, the need for the system and the requirements keep changing. So your system should be flexible enough to accommodate these changes as we go ahead. And the most important is obsolescence. Many of the electronic components, computer subsystems that you use in a strategic system, they get obsolete. So how do we go ahead and uh, manage it is another big challenge. Okay? Then comes the bigger challenge of documenting what you have developed and maintaining it for 30 years. So proper documentation, detailed documentation is a must. Right? The, one can use a platform architecture to uh, ensure obsolescence and also tomorrow's updations. So you want to add a different subsystem in a platform architecture will help you do that. And if 
we have, uh, as we discussed earlier, if we adopt the software defined systems architecture concept, then we know that a lot of things can be changed in the embedded software, right? So the functionalities, features, etc., can be a, to good extent updated or changed in the software defined system. So hence, adopting a software defined system architecture is important for a weapon system that has to survive for nearly 30 years. And as regards manufacturing, it's important that we adopt Industry 4.0, which will help us manufacture in a very elegant manner and also repeat manufacturing over a period of time. And as we all know, we need advanced simulation of systems to validate our systems before we start manufacturing them and using them. And these uh, strategic systems has to withstand harsh environmental and intense EMIMC requirements, right? And Last but not least is that these systems should be cyber hardened and EMP hardened. Okay, cyber attacks and EMP pulses, electromagnetic pulses can destroy the system. Okay, and make them uh, very vulnerable to that. So we should have the system designed to meet cyber attacks, or rather resist cyber attacks and resist EMP showers. Right, and. As we saw earlier, the obsolescence management is very, very important. 30 years life cycle of a strategic system, the parts, components may change, may not, it may not be available to repair a system. Okay? So there should be a robust obsolescence management strategy wherein we are able to do a, a drop-in replacement or replace it by something else and change the interface or whatever is required to make obsolescence, uh, manage obsolescence. Right? So, obsolescence is a reality and managing them effectively over a period of 30 years is important. So, all your system design should be accordingly and appropriately done. For example, you choose a processor, you should choose the right processor that has a higher lifespan, life cycle than the uh, a very exotic ones that may only be there for a short while. So, that is a decision that you have to take very uh, appropriately. Right? Having talked about the uh, strategic systems, we know that there are a lot of talk about AI and machine learning getting into defense systems or strategic systems. Okay? So recently, as late as uh, a year ago, there was a uh, news release by the Indian Army saying that they are going to use lasers, robotics and AI for warfare. The Times of India had reported it and just sharing that uh, thing with you all. Okay? Maybe you can look up these details. The gist of it is that AI, robotics, lasers are going to play a major role in strategy systems or defense systems. Right? The few months ba back, the army chief stated that we need AI to fight and win our wars. Right? So this is very important statement made by him, and we all know that there have been a lot of efforts. Uh, in the Indian defense services and the developers to incorporate or embed AI machine learning into defense systems. Okay? And this statement from the army chief adds to that uh, requirement. Right? And having said this, how do we commercialize technology? Okay? So, f for that we should have a research departments in science and technology. Unless we do the right research in science and technology, we may not be able to evolve and come up with the right technology. Developing a product is the last phase of it. Before that, we should have a research and development in the sciences and technologies. Then we have to conceptualize a product or a system, right? And then refine the product system to match with the end user. That's very important. You may have a good product, but the end user may not need it, okay? So matching your product concepts with that of the end users is very important apart from using the right technology, right scientific principles, etc. Right? And compared to the earlier methods, we may have to uh, adapt agile uh, uh, development methodologies, okay? looping in the end user right from the day one. So that we will get a feel of what he wants accordingly uh, tailor our system. So that by the time the system is ready, the end user is falling in love with it and he is going to use it. And uh, the environmental impact of the product or system that we develop is also important. Okay? Uh, the climate change is going to affect us, so we should not develop a system which will be environment unfriendly. Okay? And last but not least, how do you retire a system?
okay. Maybe 20, 30 years later, we need to retire them. So how can we retire a system without impacting the environment? That is also equally important. Right. So as we uh, saw earlier, AI and machine learning is going to have play a major role in the defense systems. Okay. And good enough, Indian MOD has an AI ML strategy. It is formulated by a higher level committee a few years back. And uh, remember, US has export regulations for AI systems. They will not export any AI systems outside the US. Machine learning depends on the quality of data for training and this data is available with us for our applications. For our applications, we need our data to train our models. So nobody can give us the data. So we need to take our data, quality data, tag them properly and use it for training our system. So AI machine learning development has to be by us. Uh, so again I am reiterating the AI systems have to be necessarily developed indigenously okay? and ecosystem for defense projects is fast growing similar to the auto industry and uh, example in the case of the Akash weapon system where there are 600 partners. Right? As an epilogue let me say that if as an engineer we have a half life, if we do not do any studies what is our half life, how long can we uh, sustain ourselves with no new studies. Okay. This half life is getting closer to 6 months uh, less than that. So it is important that we all as engineers adopt lifelong learning. right? And you can be active in INAE, IEEE, IET, all of the organizations which helps you learn continuously with the latest in te uh, technologies. Okay. Maybe a weekly technical seminar or a, uh, is good to share uh, information or technology updates etc. Okay. And importantly we should uh, imbibe the culture of IP creation and patenting. It is very important that we need to worry about how to create IP and how to patent. Ensure as professional engineers, professional people we should ensure that we do not infringe anybody else's patent. Okay. So hence patent search and ensuring that our uh, products are not uh, infringing somebody else's patents is important. Okay. And it is important that we as industry collaborate with the academia okay, to get the best of science and technology into our products. They are not going to help us develop a product but they are going to give us the right inputs of science and technology to develop a product. Okay. The TRL, the te technology readiness levels, manufacturing readiness levels, these are important. We should have a roadmap of each of our systems. What is this TRL, what is this MRL going to be? Okay. And last but not least, there is a difference between know how and know why. Okay. I know how it works but I do not know why it works. If only I know how, why it works and how it works both, then only we can adopt and uh, upgrade it as we go ahead. Right? India imports less than 70, uh, more than 70 percent of the defense requirements okay. and that too we get old generation systems. So it is very important that we develop our own latest systems. Okay. And earlier military used to be the leader in development, now civil is taking over, example is machine learning, 5G etc. Right. So we are looking forward to create in India, created by Indians, conceived, system engineered, designed, developed, manufactured, deployed, upgraded and tech refreshed and retired by us. This should be our objective. And with this, thank you all. Let peace prevail. Thank you, Mr. Raghavan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and Jai Hind.